Unassumed, the Tate Pack Series, Book Four, Chapter One. He was going to kill him, plain and simple. Tun needed to have the shit beat out of him, and Howell Lures Marshall was just the cowboy to do it. Howell stared at Tun in shock and anger. He understood Tun was still hurt and angry that Tommy, the man Tun had informed them all was his mate, hadn't been able to handle the whole wolf shifter thing and had taken off. Well, no, he didn't understand it. He knew that, as a wolf shifter, he had a mate out there somewhere. He just hoped their paths never crossed. He didn't want a mate. He didn't need another reason to keep looking over his shoulder. He had enough of that already. It was bad enough that he'd gotten to be friends with the guys from the Tate Pack. He didn't need to add a mate as another sack of luggage. Besides, while he saw that Richard and Veth, the Pack Alpha, definitely had a connection and were in love, he wasn't so sure their connection had anything to do with them being soulmates. He was pretty sure their fierce closeness was just about love. Tun and Tommy hadn't been together long enough to have formed that type of connection. Besides, Tun didn't seem the type to fall for someone like Tommy, and all of his moping around and bitching was just starting to piss Howell the fuck off. Shoving Tun out of the way, Howell stormed out of the house, slamming the door open before him, ignoring the sound of Richard yelling at him to stop. I'm either going to bend him over to fuck him or bend him over to fucking kick his ass because he definitely needs one or the other to happen. Howell snarled as he stomped angrily towards his truck, ignoring Richard, who ran behind him, clutching one of the triplets to his chest. Jerking open the driver's side door to his F-150, Howell turned and stared almost angrily to the mate of the Alpha. He wasn't mad at Richard. He was pissed off at Anton Forrester, better known as Tun. The huge beta had been moping around the ranch for the past few weeks, and then subsequently turning around and growling at everyone who crossed his path. Howell was sick of it, and was on the verge of letting his wolf take over and have it out with the slightly larger man. He's just upset, Howell. He didn't mean it, Richard gasped as he came to a stop in front of Howell, his face red as he panted from the lack of breath. Any other time, Howell would have laughed at Richard's appearance. The formerly impeccably dressed New York dancer now looked like a frazzled, tired Texan rancher's housewife. Howell would never utter those words to the smaller man, but with his blonde hair in disarray, clutching a now sleeping child to his misbuttoned checkered shirt, clad chest, his wrangler jeans hugging his slight hips, the hem of the pants covered in red Texas mud, his feet bare. He just really misses Tommy. You know he only left three weeks ago. Tun's just having a hard time. Don't leave, Howell. He really didn't mean what he said, Richard finished with an exhausted sigh. Chuckling in the face of Richard's obvious exhaustion, Howell leaned forward and snatched the infant out of Richard's arms. Kurt, which was the one he was holding, he thought it was Kurt anyway, breathing a sigh of relief that the baby hadn't woken up at his sudden shift in position and height, Howell looked down at Richard. The Alpha's mate was quickly becoming his best friend. Of course, he wouldn't tell the little Yankee that little piece of information, because he'd never hear the end of it if he did. But it was the truth. His rather surprisingly close relationship with Richard is the reason why he'd even bothered to stop and tell the mate he was leaving. I don't understand why he's letting that little cross-dresser's leaving bother him so much. I mean, he was just a man. Al muttered as he watched in fascination when Kurt yawned in his sleep and then stuck his right thumb in his mouth, all without waking up. Children were fascinating to Hal. Of course, his fascination with them didn't mean he wanted any. Far from it. Children were right up there with a mate, things he absolutely did not want. He didn't see the purpose of having either. What man in his right mind would give up all of the possible gorgeous ass out there in the world just so he could wake up to the same person every morning? It made absolutely no sense to him. Ignoring the voice that called him a liar, the voice that sounded amazingly like his sister, Noelle, Howell handed Kurt back to Richard when the other man held out his arms. Tommy is so much more than just a cross-dresser, Richard huffed as he adjusted Kurt in his arms, grimacing when the infant started to whimper. Please don't wake up, please don't wake up, Howell heard the smaller man mutter, and felt a temporary flash of sympathy for the smaller man before he turned back towards his truck. Look, it don't matter to me what the hell Tommy is. All I care about is that Tun is walking around with his dick so hard and his balls so goddamn blue that he just insulted my family and my ethnicity. 
and my hair, Al growled, grabbing one of the long ropes of his dreadlocks and displaying it to Richard, who grimaced. Everyone knew the three things of Hal Lurge Marshall's you did not insult, his family, his ethnicity, and his hair. Howell was a very proud Caribbean-American black man, with a family history so rich in Barbados where they emigrated from, even he couldn't believe it sometimes. As far as his hair went, Howell rubbed the end of his dreadlock before tossing it over his shoulder to join the others. He'd been growing his hair since he was twelve, and he, Noel, and their cousin Latroy had all made the pact to never cut their hair and to keep it dreaded up. It was something they'd done in honor of their deceased cousin, Latanya. Latroy's twin sister, who had been kidnapped and killed when they were still children. The news media hadn't covered his cousin's disappearance, something that hadn't really shocked his family or most of the black community. It was a well-known fact amongst minorities that most African Americans who went missing didn't get any big media coverage, at least not until a celebrity or political figure got involved and decided to speak up about it. While Hispanics and Asians received a little more coverage than blacks, even their coverage was limited at best. So Howell's family had appealed to the Georgia Police Department and the Georgia news media, but had only done so out of a sense of duty. When nothing happened, they were not too surprised by the apathy. The family had instead poured into the streets of Rome, Georgia, and all of the surrounding cities, even going hours away into Fairburn and Atlanta and still coming up with nothing. After nothing still had turned up three weeks later through the human law enforcement system, his family, full of shifters, had gone on the prowl looking for the young girl themselves. Latanya's body had been found in a forest in Jacksonville, Florida, only five weeks after she went missing. Her body had been raped and viciously mutilated, and while those things were devastating, they weren't what had horrified the family. It was the letter that had been left with her remains. One nigger bitch wolf down, and so many more to go. Always overly cautious, his family had realized then that there were only three children left in the family, and they had to do whatever they had to in order to keep them safe. So they had faked the fatal accident that supposedly had taken the lives of him, Noel, and Latroy, and then had a funeral for all three of them. His family had then split up him, Noel, and Latroy, sending all three of them to different orphanages to live until they came of age though they made sure the three cousins, and especially Noel and Howell, stayed in touch with each other. It was something the three of them still made sure to do, stay in touch. He wouldn't think about the fact that he hadn't heard from Latroy or Noel in the past three weeks. They were probably just busy with their children. That had to be it. It was the only plausible explanation. He wouldn't imagine that it was anything else. Howell? Howell? Richard's voice yanked him out of the past with a vicious tug, and Howell gritted his teeth to stop the growl that threatened to be ripped from his throat. Sorry, he apologized, his voice low and rumbly as he forcefully shoved his wolf back. He had to get out of there and get himself under control. Turning quickly towards his truck, Howell hopped in and slammed his door shut. Looking out into the confused gaze of his closest friend, Howell knew that he had to explain something. He hadn't told anyone in his pack about Latanya or the family he'd left behind in Georgia, and had no plans to ever do so. Look, Rich, it ain't about you, okay? It ain't even really about Ton, although I think all he needs is a really good fuck by me or someone else who ain't gonna just bend to his whim and is gonna make him take it instead of taking it themselves. He'll get over Tommy real quick, like, if that happens. It's just... He sighed gritting his teeth against the howl of despair that threatened to explode from his chest. Where the hell was his sister and his cousin? Why hadn't they contacted him? He once again yanked his mind back to the present, and took a shuddering breath before he continued, I got some shit I gotta work through. You know what I'm saying? This ain't a good time for me to really be dealing with ton shit when I got my own that I need to work out. Hal sighed. He knew he wasn't doing anything but making Richard much more curious, which he could see in the dancer's eyes. But Hal wasn't going to indulge the other man's addiction for gossip. He was getting the hell out of there, right then. I'll call you whenever I stop, Hal said before cranking up his truck. Where are you going? Richard asked as Hal started to pull down the driveway. I don't know. Probably Las Vegas. Hal stated before he backed out and quickly spun his truck around in the wide gravel drive and headed away from the ranch, his pack, Ton, Ton's problems with his mate, Tommy, 
and Howell's own demons from his past. Michael Prasacci bit his lower lip nervously and smoothed down his blond hair as he observed himself in the mirror. Something still wasn't right. He turned to look at his ass in the tight, curve-hugging, lucky jeans that he'd just bought and sighed in abject disappointment. No matter what he did, he never seemed completely satisfied. He smoothed down the front of his light lavender button-down shirt over his B-cup-sized breasts and sighed again. Maybe that was what was wrong. They weren't big enough? Or maybe they were too big. You know, no matter how many times you stare or how many times you touch them, they aren't going to get bigger. Michael's older sister, Katharina, signed to him after tapping him on his shoulder. Michael rolled his eyes and flipped off his know-it-all sister. Sometimes she got on his last damn nerve. What the hell did she know? She'd been born into the right body, had never had to struggle with her gender or her sex or her sexual identity. People didn't look at her and try to figure out whom, or rather, what, she was. She didn't have to deal with the ever-persistent ache and stab of guilt at knowing that because of her, her only sibling had also been tossed out of their pack. Those things were Michael's reality. It was his everyday, never-ending truth, and contrary to popular belief or the misconceptions of the religious right wing or even the ignorant left, he did not choose to feel like this. Who in their right mind would choose to feel like a prisoner in their own body? No one sane. No one that he knew. Michael heaved a big dramatic sigh, watching as his small silicon-implanted breasts rose and fell with the deep breath he took. He still wasn't happy by what he saw in the mirror. He reached up a hand and gently ran his fingers through his blonde hair, his eyes closing as he shivered in delight at the small impromptu head massage. Gods, maybe that was all he needed. A really good massage given to him by a gorgeous, tall, black man with long, black dreadlocks, a gorgeous smile, broad chest, and a dick like a fucking horse. It was the image of the man he'd been dreaming about for the past few years that filled his mind in that moment. The man had definitely been haunting him, and Michael could only hope the man in question was his mate, and that said mate could give one hell of a head massage, because Michael desperately needed one. Either head would work, too the one that held his big brain, and the one that held his little one. Then maybe he'd feel better. Maybe all of his problems, the discontent with his body, the anger at being deaf, the guilt at being gay, and the confusion at still being deaf, even though he was a wolf shifter, and the ever-present disappointment with life in general and in his own circumstantial celibacy, would all be solved with a really good toe-curling massage from the man of his dream. Michael laughed at his own idiocy. At least he hoped that's what he'd done. He was never actually sure his sounds of amusement actually came out sounding as they should. He felt his eyebrows pull down into a frown, the familiar anger rising up in his chest, making his hands ball into fists and his teeth grit angrily. He lifted the bald fist of his right hand to punch the wall when he felt his sister's hand lightly touching his arm. Relaxing at her touch, almost immediately, Michael felt the gentle, warm brush of her spirit sweep over his own spirit. Gods, he loved how his sister was able to do that for him, to calm him with one touch. He knew he had a mate out there, somewhere, had in fact been dreaming about said mate for months, years. Each time the man became more distinct, more clear to his mind's eye. He'd gotten the first glimpse of his mate when he was a young boy. His mate had been crying at a funeral, and he'd wanted to comfort him. The image had changed over the years, and he'd watched as his mate had grown up and grown harder physically. He could only hope whoever this mystery man was, he wasn't someone prone to big displays of anger and emotion. Michael needed peace and calm while he made his transition, as much peace and calm as he could possibly hope to get. He could only hope his mate provided him the peace that he so desired. He also hoped that he would be able to give his mate a life of happiness and love, so he would never have to see him cry again. He opened his eyes when he felt the gentle, sweet touch of his sister's hand on his face. He smiled at her and watched as the worry on her face eased. She grinned broadly back at him before she lifted her hands completely from his face in order to sign to him. Want to go down and get a coffee? With an energetic nod, Michael moved to follow her from the room and downstairs to the coffee shop they lived above, and she managed. They had been very fortunate to find the apartment and the job, and even more so when the owner gave them permission to make some adjustments to the place to make it more deaf-friendly. 
Michael hesitated before taking the first step down to the shop. He couldn't exactly explain it, but he suddenly felt as if he had to hurry up and get downstairs. Something, or someone, that would change his life forever was waiting for him downstairs. Shoving away the fear that threatened to eat at his insides, he squared his shoulders and, with one final glance at the mirror on the wall at the bottom of the steps, followed Katharina through the door into the shop. He looked around the room at first with a very critical eye. Whenever Katharina wasn't working, the shop tended to go to shit, and so he felt it was his duty as her little brother to always observe the store and make sure things were as they needed to be. Turning when he felt his sister's hand on his wrist, he looked over at her and noticed her gesturing as if she were drinking. Rolling his eyes and grinning at her, he nodded and let her know that yes, he wanted a cup of coffee, which he was pretty sure was the whole purpose he'd left his intense perusal of his body to come downstairs with her in the first place. He shook his head in fond exasperation when she blew him a kiss before heading off behind the counter. He knew his sister was beautiful, and the admiring gazes from the other men in the store did nothing but confirm that fact to him. He wished he could announce to them all that his sister was a very proud lesbian, but he knew they wouldn't believe him, even if he could talk to them. So he shrugged and looked away from his sister. He turned back to look over the patrons in the room. His eyes took in the beauty of the painted dark purple walls with gold sconces on them. His eyes swept over the circular cherry marble wood tables and the black iron chairs all filled with customers, to the long line of customers that still stood in line in front of the cash register, waiting to place their orders. It was here he felt his eyes widen, as the most amazing smell assailed his nostrils. His eyes slid closed as the smell of peaches, horses, and melted caramel filled his nose. He felt his chest expand as every hair on his body stood on end. His heart began rapidly pounding in his chest, and he felt his spirit man fighting against his wolf in an attempt to prevent himself from shifting in public. His cock hardened almost painfully, the throbbing there sinking up with the pounding of his heartbeat and every other pulse point in his body. Only one thing could cause him to have such a reaction. His mate was here. Opening his eyes, he saw the large black man moments before he walked forward and pressed him roughly against the door behind him. He saw Katharina's eyes widen as well as the looks of shock and horror that crossed the faces of everyone else in the shop, and he raised his hand and shook his head slightly to let them know that he was okay. There was no need for them to worry. He was perfectly fine. He was the safest place that he'd ever be, in his mate's arms. His head tilted back when he felt the other man press his nose to the side of his neck, and he shivered with delight as he felt the larger man's breath on his neck. Shortly thereafter, he felt the raspy texture of the other man's tongue in the same area, causing his every cell to tremble within his flushed body. He was going to have an orgasm right here in front of everyone, and he couldn't even bring himself to give a flying fuck. He gripped his mate's biceps in his hand and curled his toes in his pair of black Nordstrom shoes when he felt the slight scrape of his mate's incisors on his throat. They were practically making out and having sex right there in front of everyone in the shop. And Michael knew without a doubt that he really didn't care. He was practically begging his mate without words to fuck him in front of a room full of strangers. If his mate asked him at that moment, and if he could hear him ask, he would happily strip and assume the head-down ass-up position. After the whole debacle with his birth pack, them finding out that he was gay, then them finding out that he liked to wear women's clothes sometimes, he'd grown very private, very conservative in public. No one needed to know that he fantasized about having sex in a public place. It was something that he would never allow himself to do. It was illegal, number one, and because he'd learned long ago that when something like that happened and he got caught, which he always did, then he'd be the only one to get in trouble. The other guy always got away scot-free. So why in all of the God's name was he panting and practically desperate for his mate to rip his clothes off and fuck him right there in front of everyone? Giving himself a mental shake and realizing that it was probably just the whole just-found-my-mate thing, he looked up at the man in question. He stared at the beautiful chocolate skin and up over the very prominent Adam's apple, over the chin that was covered with hair, past his beautiful and moving plump lips to the thin nose and the gorgeous light brown eyes that fairly sparkled with excitement. 
It wasn't until he'd reached the black hair that had been twisted and intricately arranged in beautiful dreadlocks that he realized what he'd failed to fully categorize and accept before. His mate was talking to him, and had been for a while. Feeling like a complete asshole in that moment because he'd forgotten to let the other man know he was deaf, he placed the palm of his left hand over the gorgeous man's heart and felt the vibrations in his chest stop as the other man stopped talking. Michael inhaled deeply, the smell of his mate rushing through his blood and making him almost lightheaded with its delightful scent. With his right hand, he pointed to his right ear and shook his head, trying his best to alert his mate to the fact that he couldn't hear. The vibration under his hand alerted him to the fact that his mate was talking again, and he lifted his gaze from his hand on the other man's chest and up to the other man's lips. I. Don't. Care. He read slowly as his mate's lips slowly formed the words. Feeling his eyes fill with tears, he lifted his eyes to the other man's eyes, hoping the other man could see the almost desperate hope shining there that he felt thrumming through his veins. When his beautiful black man merely nodded his head with a smile, Michael launched himself into his arms, wrapping his arms around the other man's neck and pressing his very erect cock against the other man's stomach. He was so happy that he was extremely shocked when he felt himself being shoved back. What the hell was wrong? He watched as his mate's eyes traveled from his breasts down to his prominently displayed erection with a look of shock, like a bucket of cold water had been dumped on his head. Michael saw all of his hopes and dreams for a happily ever after with his mate flowing down the drain. He was a freak. A short, deaf, wolf-shifting freak. No wonder his mate didn't want him. With despair flowing off of him in waves and a grief so strong that it nearly dropped him to his knees, Michael pressed firmly against his mate. No, this stranger until he stepped back as if in a daze, and wrenching open the door that led to the apartment he shared with his sister, he ran upstairs without a backward glance. And if he tripped a few times running up the stairs because of the tears that clouded his vision, well, could anyone blame him? Chapter 2 It took Howell a full three minutes before he snapped out of the stupor that he'd fallen into. Three minutes before he finally understood exactly what was going on with his mate. Three minutes before he realized that his shock at discovering that his mate had not only soft womanly breasts, but also a nice firm cock, had probably been construed as disgust at finding out that his mate was transitioning. Three minutes before he realized that his mate probably thought he was disgusted at him. Three minutes before he realized that he was a shit and an asshole. Three minutes before he realized that Richard was right and that when he finally met his mate, he'd make the biggest ass out of himself. Stupid New Yorker. It took him another full minute after that thought, four minutes since his mate had raced up the stairs in dejection and pain, before he realized that he should probably go after his mate. Giving himself a firm shake, both mentally and physically shaking his body into action, he went to step forward only to find himself standing in front of the person that he'd originally thought was his mate's twin sister, but that he could now see was his mate's older sister, his mate's older, much more pissed-off sister. No doubt she'd just seen what had happened between him and his mate. She looked disgusted with him, worried about her brother, but more than that, she looked like she was ready to kick his ass. By the slight gleam from her right incisor, she was more than capable of doing so. He lifted his hands to start signing, or trying to sign, he did know the alphabet at least, when he heard the almost angry huff coming from the woman in front of him. I can hear and speak, you fucking idiot, she growled at him, and Howell felt his hackles rise. Who was this little chit to speak to him like that? Didn't she know who he was? Didn't she know which pack he came from? Bigger than the fucking Tate Pack, he came from the Barbados-based, Georgia-planted Lures Marshall Pack. They were the most powerful pack in America next to the Prasachi Pack, but it didn't matter at that point. Howell was facing a very angry sister, and he was instantly contrite. He knew that he'd fucked up. Big time. Sorry, he apologized and gave her a small smile, which instantly fell from his face when he saw that she wasn't the least bit affected by it. What was up with this woman? Did she have anti-Howell repellent on or something? You hurt my Michael, she stated to him, and Howell felt his brows pull down in a frown. 
Who the fuck was Michael? My brother, the guy you pushed into the door and were grinding all over just a few minutes ago. Your mate? She growled at him. She rolled her eyes at him and Howell instantly felt like an even bigger asshole than he had previously. You didn't even get his name. What the hell is wrong with you? First, you just push up on him, and then you act like he disgusts you, and then you don't even chase after him? And in all of this bullshit, you didn't even get the name of the person you were screwing over? Howell winced at the very accurate description of events and wished for the first time that he were a snake shifter, so that he could turn into one and slither away in shame at that moment. He could feel the wolf inside of him whimpering and tucking his tail in misery. Gods, his mate was better off without him. Only Howell had found him now, despite his resolve to never find the person who was created to be his mate, and he wasn't going to give him up without a fight. He looked down at the woman standing in front of him and knew that his first step was to get Michael's sister to let him go upstairs and see his mate. He opened his mouth to apologize again and to plead with her to let him see Michael when he saw her smile at him. It was a smile that to anyone else would have appeared sweet and completely non-threatening but one that had him completely filled with dread. Oh, he was so scared of what she was about to say. You need to go upstairs and apologize to my brother, she said sweetly, and Hal blinked in puzzlement at her. Why was she allowing him to go upstairs? Granted, it was what he wanted, but he was suddenly very leery of taking that next step. Taking a cautious step forward, Hal nodded at her. Thank you he said with a confused tone in his voice. He watched as her grin widened and knew true fear for the first time in years. He very much felt like a mouse making its way closer and closer to the mouth of a snake that he'd previously thought was dead, only to find out that it was alive, seconds before the jaws of the predator had closed around his throat. Taking another step towards the stairs, Howell wasn't surprised to feel the firm grasp of the woman's hand on his bicep, and he looked down at her. She was very beautiful. He wouldn't deny that. Her blonde hair was almost as beautiful as Michael's blonde hair. Owl felt his cock thicken at the thought of running his fingers through his mate's lustrous locks. Thinking about the man's hair made him think about his head, his eyes, his nose, his lips. And thinking about his lips caused the wolf within him to pant with extreme desire. He knew that Michael's sister, whose name he still didn't know, could smell the arousal wafting off of him but when his eyes swung up towards the stairs, he knew that he didn't care. Just so you know, she started talking to him again, and Hal dragged his eyes back down to her face. Michael has been hurt enough in this life. He was mistreated by our parents because he was born deaf. The first wolf shifter that we've ever heard about who was born deaf, who once they shifted, wasn't able to heal from it. Then he was kicked out of our pack for coming out as gay when they found out that he was transgender as well. Al heard the catch in her voice and felt his wolf growl inside of him. Someone had hurt his mate. He just knew it. They had hurt him badly, and he would find out who they were and he would make them pay. All of them. They almost killed him. They almost killed my baby brother. The only sibling that my parents ever gave me, and those bastards almost killed him because biology fucked up and gave him the wrong body, she whispered, and Howell saw her big blue eyes fill with tears and felt as if he'd been punched in the gut very hard. He hated to see a woman cry, but this woman had felt as if he felt her every pain, her every heart-wrenching, soul-stirring twist of heartache in his own body. It was very disconcerting. So I don't care if you're his mate or not. I don't care if he thinks that you're the most gorgeous man on earth. If he thinks that the sun rises and falls out of your ass. If you hurt my brother, I will hunt you down in the street and kill you. Owl desperately struggled to ignore the icy heat that washed over his spine at the sister's words. He knew that there was no way that she could have known that her words made him think of his family in Georgia and the threat that still hung over his head. He knew that there was no way that she could have known that those words made him want to run as far and as fast as he could away from Michael just to keep him safe. She had absolutely no idea, and he had no plans to tell her. At all. Ever. Hal nodded. He had heard her threat and took it for the promise that it was. He was being given a very rare opportunity. 
the chance to apologize to his mate. It was special and precious, and he was being told to treat it as such. So he would. I understand what you're saying, he said to her. I promise that I will do everything within my power to not hurt him, to never hurt him, to keep him safe and protect him. I swear. He promised as he lifted his right fist and placed it over his heart. She nodded at him, and Howell felt peace instantly wash over him. She'd forgiven him, for now, and for that he was eternally grateful. He placed his hand over hers on his bicep and gave it a slight squeeze. He smiled at her when she nodded at him in approval and turned to head up the stairs. My name's Katharina, by the way, she said with a grin. Howell stopped his trek forward and turned back to look at her. Nice to meet you, Katharina, he said, feeling his face stretch into the first real grin he'd had in the last fifteen minutes. My name is Howell, Howell Lures Marshall. It's really nice to meet you. Uncertain of why Katharina's face suddenly bleached white of all color, and not willing to spare another minute trying to figure out why, Howell turned and hurried up the steps towards his mate, taking the stairs two at a time. He thought of every possible thing he could say or do to make up his extreme idiocy to Michael, only to remember once again that his mate couldn't hear. He sorted through and discarded almost a hundred different reactions and apologies before he finally reached the door to the apartment. Uncertain of protocol on how to enter, and while noticing the doorbell beside the door, he was very aware that if he rang the doorbell, his mate wouldn't hear it. So, raising his nose, he sniffed the air and detected the distinct smell of his mate. Peaches, fresh bread, and cinnamon. Howell groaned as he felt his cock fill with blood, and he reached a hand down to adjust his thickened shaft. Placing his hand on the doorframe, Howell closed his eyes and tried to calm his body's raging hormones. He inhaled and shivered as the smell of his mate got stronger, letting him know that the other man was coming towards the door. While Howell could smell Katharina and faint traces of other people, food and coffee, it was the smell of his mate that made his limbs weak and caused him to hold on to the doorframe in order to keep his footing. Inhaling again, Howell pulled up short and sniffed once more, feeling his forehead bunch together as he frowned, his skin stretching tight as he fought the shift from man to wolf. He ground his teeth together and tossed his head back as he pushed back against the wolf inside of him that clamored to get out. He could smell his mate and the other distinct scent of salt water. His mate had been or was crying, and it was all Howell's fault. He was an asshole. Michael could smell him. He was standing right outside the door, just standing there. Sniffling, Michael wiped his face with the tissues that he held in his hand and gave a shuddering sigh. Why the hell wasn't he coming inside? Was he that disgusted with Michael that he couldn't even face him? Even though he'd come all the way upstairs, how disgusting did he actually find Michael? Did he think Michael was an abomination because he was a man who liked having breasts and liked dressing up as a woman sometimes? Or was Michael disgusting because he was a woman who liked having a cock and a prostate? What was turning his mate off so much? Michael didn't understand it. Humans need to define and label everything. Even the most open-minded of people seem to have a box that they put everyone in, and in order to be in a box, certain items had to be checked off before you were accepted as that particular identification. Oh, so you think you're a gay man. Do you like sucking cock? Check. Do you like having anal? Check. Are you either a twink or a big athletic man? Do you know about fashion? Do you love Madonna, Cher, Lady Gaga, Barbara Streisand, Diana Ross, Christina Aguilera, George Michael, and Elton John? Do you live in a fabulous apartment, own a tiny dog or cat, and have dinner parties all of the time? If you didn't check off all of those, then you're not gay. Michael shook his head as he thought of that stupid conversation with his parents. They'd asked him those questions, very bluntly and to the point. Then they'd tried to prove to him what gender he actually was. They hadn't succeeded. Michael had been completely middle of the road with both sexes. Katharina had stormed into the room and informed them that he was neither male nor female gay nor straight, transgender or not, he was just Michael. The two of them had packed that night and moved away, never looking back. They'd barely managed to avoid the fire that had mysteriously burned down the guest house where Michael had been sent to live in by his parents after he'd come out to them. No one had ever been arrested in conjunction with the fire, and in fact they'd been told that it was just a freak accident. They'd both known better, though, and had cut all ties with their biologicals. They were both much better off, or at least they had been, and then Howell had shown up. The asshole. 
Michael glared at the door that his mate stood behind and wished all sort of horrible plagues to befall his body, then instantly felt guilty for thinking such things. If something happened to his mate, he'd instantly feel as if it fell to him to take care of the other man. He sighed. This whole mate thing was already becoming a pain in his ass. When another minute passed and his mate still hadn't come through the door or even rang the doorbell, Michael threw forward his hand and jerked open the door and found himself staring up into the very confused gaze of his mate. The look was so unbelievably amusing that Michael had to force himself to not laugh, though he was pretty sure that a snort came out if his mate's reaction was any indication. The other man looked positively put out by Michael's amusement, and any other time Michael would have apologized. But at that moment, he remembered why the man was even hesitant to speak to him anyway. The whole being disgusted by Michael thing. The asshole. Narrowing his eyes at the taller man, Michael turned and walked away angrily, not stopping until he was on the other side of the room. And then he turned to stare at the man who had only come into the room and closed the door, and then not moved from there. What the hell was wrong with him? Was Michael really that scary to him? Was he so disgusted by him that he didn't even want to come any closer to him? Michael tried to swallow back the tears that clogged his throat, but when he felt the tears trace his cheeks, he knew that he'd failed in that. He'd just lifted his hand to try to wipe away the tears on his face before his mate saw when he realized that the man in question was right in front of him. He was grabbed and pulled tightly to the man's broadly muscled chest, and he inhaled deeply for a moment, breathing in the man's erection-inducing scent before he began pushing him away. He didn't want the man's pity. He didn't want him to hold him because he felt guilty. He wanted him to hold him because he wanted Michael to be comforted. He wanted a mate in truth, not a mate in gesture. He kept pushing and shoving, the tears running down his face harder as he shoved and fought against the man's unrelenting hold on him. Why wasn't he letting him go? Why did he insist on hurting Michael in this way? He didn't want him didn't want to be mated to him, so why in the hell was he still holding on to him? Michael felt his world tilt on its axis and realized that his mate had picked him up. He wrapped his arms around the other man's neck and held on tightly as they walked over to the couch and then sat down. He was placed in his larger mate's lap, turned to face the other man, with his legs on either side of the man's hips, which gave him ample opportunity to feel as his cock thickened and pressed against Michael's ass. This made no sense at all to him. Why would his mate be getting turned on by him when he found Michael so grotesque? He felt his brow furrow as he shook his head in confusion. He looked up and found his gaze trapped by the sight of his mate's mouth moving very slowly as if he were mouthing words. Oh shit, he was mouthing words! What is the easiest way to talk to you? He read the words that flowed from his mate's lips and felt his heart melt just a little bit. Truly, if his mate found him hideous, he wouldn't be trying to talk to him right then, would he? Michael turned and grabbed a notepad off of the coffee table, along with a pen, and handed both items to his mate. He waited while the other man wrote, his eyes studying the larger man's features as he did so. He found himself extremely fascinated by the man's hair. He wanted to know how exactly one's hair was locked. What did they do to it? How long did it take to get it done? He jumped slightly when a piece of paper was shoved in front of his face, not expecting his mate to have written so quickly. Taking the paper with a small smile, he allowed his eyes to scan the paper in his hand. My name is Howell, H-O-W-E-L-L. Friends call me Howell, H-O-W-L. I'm sorry I was an ass. You're hot, and I want you. Now. Michael swallowed thickly as he read the words. Howell's note was short and straight to the point. Michael found that a complete turn-on. He read the words again, choking back a moan, before he lifted his gaze up to meet Howells. The black man's light brown eyes had darkened considerably, and Michael felt his heart pound in his chest. He leaned back slightly on Howells' lap, adjusting where he sat, and grinned when the other man's eyes closed. Talk about an ego boost. He'd thought that his mate had found him grotesque and disgusting, but it turned out that his mate was actually attracted to him. So maybe the fates didn't actually mess up. As Michael looked at Howell, who sat with his eyes shut, he wished, not for the first time, that he could hear. He would love to hear his mate groan at that moment and not just feel it vibrating under his ass. He took the notepad and scribbled a quick note to his, hopefully, soon-to-be lover, and hoped that he wouldn't regret his hasty decision later. I have to call into work and let them know I'm not coming in. By the way, 
My name is Michael. Michael watched as confusion swept over Howell's face as he read Michael's words, and before the other man could ask the question that Michael knew he desperately wanted to, Michael took the other man's head in his hands and turned it toward the TTY phone that sat on the desk next to the front door. He could see the curiosity that grabbed hold of his mate, and knew that if ever a time there was to show Howell what life would be like with him, this was the time. He climbed down off of Howell's lap and grabbed the other man's hand. He walked over to the phone and lifted the receiver. Punching in the numbers to the Center for Homeless, Deaf, and Hearing Youths, Michael allowed his eyes to rake over the very attractive frame of his mate as he waited for someone to pick up the phone. Once he received a reply, he sat in the chair in front of the desk and began typing his message to the receptionist. This is Professor Michael Persace. I'm afraid that I won't be able to make it into the center today to work. My boyfriend arrived in town very unexpectedly, and I want to spend a few days with him. He didn't have to wait long to receive the reply that he knew he would get from Tracy, the receptionist on duty. She'd been telling him for a while that he needed to find a boyfriend, and that his life would be much better. He'd been telling her for a while that he had someone out there, someone especially for him, and she'd merely smiled at him and told him that everyone did. He was glad to be able to show her that he was right. Oh my, Michael, I'm so excited for you. Of course I'll let Mrs. Dervishire know that you won't be in today. It's okay, really. There haven't been too many kids in today anyway. We'll probably combine classes. Have fun with your boyfriend. What's his name? Michael turned to Hal, who was watching him talk on the TTY with a fascinated expression on his face, and felt his lips spread into a wide smile. Turning back to the telephone device, he gave Tracy a final response before signing off completely. His name is Howell. Bye. Chapter 3 Howell felt his nostrils flare the moment his mate hung up the phone and heard the low growl that emanated from his chest. He knew that Michael couldn't hear the growl, but from the darkening of the other man's eyes, he knew that the smaller man could definitely smell his arousal. He didn't want to wait any longer. The time for talking would come later, much later. He knew all that he needed to know about his mate by that point. Michael was blonde, deaf, and transgender. He worked for a deaf center here in Las Vegas. He had a sister named Katharina. He'd been kicked out of his pack for being gay and transgender. More importantly than all of that, Michael was his mate. His. Really, the rest of it was all semantics and details. Reaching out one hand, he ran his hand through the soft-looking golden locks of his mate. Sighing when he felt the fleece softness of Michael's hair, he gave in to his deepest urge and lowered his face into the other man's locks and inhaled deeply. He felt the tremble that rocked through Michael's body and felt his own body return the shiver. Breathing deeply, he allowed the smell of his mate and the slight citrusy scent of the shampoo that the younger man used to waft over his senses, and grabbed Michael's hips in his hands. His wolf panted within him, pushing and pressing, wanting him to get closer, wanting him to bury himself deep inside of his mate. Brushing his hand down over the back of Michael's neck, he felt the goosebumps that rose on the man's skin and grinned. He was about to make love to his mate, and the other man didn't even know what was about to hit him. He'd never been made love to by Howell before. It was an experience that he'd make sure that Michael never forgot. Brushing his lips over Michael's forehead, he allowed his lips to trace the skin of his mate's face, kissing his eyelids, nose, his cheeks, his temple, his chin, his jaw, as his fingertips caressed down over the man's body. He was slightly surprised at the muscle definition of his mate's body, and then reprimanded himself. Just because his mate couldn't hear, it didn't mean that the man couldn't work out. He decided that that particular flub he would keep to himself, and never share, and pushed away from his mind any thoughts of his mate's limitations. He stuck out his tongue and licked at the sweat forming on his mate's brow, and trembled at the strong taste that washed over his taste buds. He'd never been the type of man to really be into licking sweat off of his partner. But being with his mate, he could definitely see the appeal now. Drifting his hands along the outside of Michael's legs, he pushed his hands underneath the blonde's ass and lifted him into his arms effortlessly. Without a word, he felt his left eyebrow quirk with the unspoken question as to where Michael's bedroom was. He watched with a satisfied smirk as Michael's eyes, which had closed tightly at some point, opened slowly and stared at him with a dazed expression. Michael looked at his face, and Howell wondered what he saw there to make that satisfied smile come across it, especially since they hadn't done anything yet. 
Michael pointed directly behind himself, and Hal headed off in the direction of his finger. He paused in front of the door that he figured was Michael's. The door was purple, and had what appeared to be a doorbell next to it. That was something that Hal knew he'd have to ask Michael about, since again he knew that his mate couldn't hear, and why in the world would he need a doorbell? He hefted Michael up further into his arms so that he could grab the doorknob, and he pushed the door open. Upon walking into the room, he paused and looked around in confusion. Michael's room looked just like his did back on the ranch in Texas, complete with alarm clock, DVD player, flat-screen television. He had a phone on the desk under the TV which was mounted on the wall, exactly like the one in the living room. What had Michael called it? A TTY? On the walls of his bedroom, there were posters of Brokeback Mountain, Criminal Minds, and Torchwood. Hal would have laughed at his mate's decision to put posters up on his wall like a teenage boy, but he could tell why the other man had done so. Deciding he could do a thorough perusal of the room later, Hal laid his future lover down on the black and purple comforter and leaned up on his elbows as he looked down into the other man's blue eyes. Gods, Michael was so beautiful that Hal wanted to cry. He held absolutely still as Michael stretched a hand up to cradle his jaw and then closed his eyes and whined feeling his chest rumble with the noise and his nose detecting the scent of Michael's arousal growing heavier, darker, and muskier. Hal wanted to roll around in that scent, brand it on his brain and smell it every day for the rest of his life. He shivered when Michael's hand drifted down the side of his face over his neck to his shoulder, his head tilting with the movement. His mate's hand was soft, moisturized, nothing like the rough, calloused hand of the cowboys and rodeo riders that Hal usually picked up. To his amazement, he much preferred his mate's soft hand rather than the rough hands he thought he'd desire. When Michael's hand lifted away, Howell opened his eyes and looked down at his mate in confusion, only to find the smaller man nibbling on his lower lip in worry. Howell felt his nose wrinkle slightly at the smell of his mate's worry and leaned over to kiss the lip that Michael had been biting on. He was amazed by the jolt that shot through his body as he experienced his first kiss with his mate. His toes clenched and his hips thrust forward, rubbing his hard cock with the equally hard erection that lay trapped behind Michael's trousers. Howell felt himself tense for a fraction of a second at the feel of Michael's breasts pressing against his before he sank down onto the body beneath his. It wasn't as bad as he thought it would be. Rather than a completely hard body beneath his, Michael just had one soft place. He traced Michael's lips with his tongue and felt his chest rumble with the groan in his throat when the other man opened his mouth to him. The hands that had been resting on Howell's shoulders now sank into his hair, wrapping the dreads around their fingers. Howell thrust his hips forward, hard as a jolt of fiery pleasure lanced up his spine when Michael pulled on the dreads wrapped around his fists. Who would have thunk it? He got turned on by a little aggression from his partner. Pulling his head down, he stared down at his tempting little mate and saw the puffy lips, swollen from his kisses, the skin there, red as an apple, his favorite fruit, and unable to help himself, he grabbed Michael's lower lip with his teeth and pulled. He let go after a moment and wondered if Michael had felt the groan that he'd just heard. He felt his lips stretch with his grin, and he gave a small chuckle before he put his lips at the edge of Michael's jaw. Kissing the area, he licked it and then nibbled it gently his wolf howling in pleasure and approval when Michael tilted his head to the side, baring his neck in a show of submission. Licking a trail from behind Michael's ear and along his neck to his collar, Howell realized that they were both still dressed. Brilliant, Al, he muttered to himself, before he stood to his feet and pulled his shirt off and hurriedly jerked off his jeans, not caring that he fell to his ass as he did so, having forgotten to pull off his boots. He heard Michael's giggle and looked up quickly. His mate's amazing laugh, while a little louder than others would deem appropriate at such an intimate time, was still melodious and beautiful. Howell felt his heart pause, as if it too were frozen by the sheer beauty of Michael, before it resumed, pounding furiously in his chest. He pulled off his boots with his sweaty hands and then his pants and boxers before he pushed up to his feet quickly. He stood stock still as he watched Michael look over his naked body slowly grinning wolfishly when the other man's eyes zeroed in on his cock. While it was a myth that every black man was amazingly endowed, it wasn't an exaggeration for the men in his family. There was a reason that he was known as Howell, and it wasn't because he was a wolf-shifter, like a lot of other shifters thought. 
It was because that was usually what his sexual partners did once he started pounding away in their ass. How? There was no way that was going to fit. No way in hell. Since it wasn't going to fit, there was no reason for him to get undressed. None at all. Michael tried to reassure himself with that thought, and was extremely angry with his hands when they, of their own free will, began unbuttoning his pants and pulling them down to bear himself to Hal's hungry gaze. He focused on the feel of the cotton trousers scratching his skin slightly as they lowered, and dropped off the tip of his toes onto the floor. Biting his lower lip harder, he grabbed the elastic waistband of his boxers and pulled them down an inch and hesitated. Gods, could he do this? Howell was almost physical perfection. Even with the tattoos scattered on his skin, the words on his chest, and the tribal band on his left bicep, and was that an arrow on his right hip? Michael snickered. The arrow was pointing towards Howell's very erect cock. That was the other problem. Howell's cock was big and beautiful, but Michael had been on estrogen for almost an entire year before he stopped, and the pills worked almost exactly like steroids. He wasn't at all as endowed as he used to be, which actually hadn't been a lot in the first place. Would Hal be disappointed when he finally saw Michael naked? Feeling despair wash over him and on the verge of apologizing to Hal, Michael was surprised to feel Hal pick up his right foot and press a kiss to the arch of it. His gaze flew to Hal's and he could feel surprise spread through his body. The surprise soon changed to white-hot longing as Hal continued to kiss and lick his foot and up to his toes. Michael had the urge to kick Howell away from his foot. He was very aware that he'd been wearing shoes and socks for a while before he'd come stomping back upstairs and kicked them off. He knew that Howell wasn't exactly kissing, licking, and sucking on clean, fresh-smelling toes, but the other man seemed to be enjoying it, if his closed eyes and the scent of pleasure rolling off of him was anything to go by. Michael gripped the sheets next to his still-clothed body as Howell slowly kissed his way up the inside of Michael's leg towards his groin. The burning hot flush of desire zapped his body and made him groan with need. He tilted his head back, pressing it firmly into the mattress beneath him as he felt Howell grip the elastic waistband of his boxers in his teeth and growl. He almost laughed at his mate's absurdity, and would have laughed with extreme delight if the tip of Howell's canines hadn't very gently nicked the flesh of his hip. He thrust his hip up towards his mate's mouth and gripped Hal's hair in his fists again. Some part of his brain informed him that he was supposed to be stopping Hal from undressing him. That he had, not even five minutes before, decided against having sex with the oh-so-sexy black man. However, the sound of his panting and his moaning as Hal licked up the inside of his thighs as he pulled Michael's boxers completely off, drowned off that fearful, rational part of his brain. He shivered as Hal nuzzled and licked his hairless crotch rather than pushing him away from his less than impressive length. He moaned when Hal licked from the base of his erection to the tip of it rather than stopping his mate. And when Hal grabbed the placket of the button-up shirt that he wore and tore it with a loud growl, buttons flying all over the room, one almost plopping him in the face, he still didn't protest. As a matter of fact, he'd almost forgotten why he'd been so afraid of being naked with Hal until he felt his mate's fingers ease under the bra strap on his right shoulder and lightly fondle the skin there. Michael felt every muscle in his body tense and go on full alert. He waited for Hal to push him away in disgust. He waited for the other man to shift and attack him, because no matter what Hal had said to him earlier, being face to face with the reality of who Michael really was was something very different than just the faint idea of it. So when neither of those things happened, Michael opened his eyes that he hadn't even been aware that he'd closed, and looked up into Hal's face as the other man looked down at his breasts. Hal was smiling, his eyes had grown darker, and Michael sniffed delicately, his arousal had definitely grown heavier. Could it be that his mate was actually still attracted to him this way? How was that even possible? From the look of him, Hal seemed to be the type of man who would pick a gender and stick with it, not one who seemed to be almost fluid with his sexual preferences. Was that even possible? Sure, he'd heard of bisexuals before, but a bisexual was completely different from someone who was gender fluid. Had fate finally done something right in his life and given him a mate that was completely okay with his body in a way that he still struggled to be? Michael got his answer when Hal tore the bra from his body and latched his mouth onto the peak of Michael's very pebbled nipple. 
Michael felt his throat vibrate with what he could only assume was a cry up ripped from his chest. He blinked his eyes repeatedly, his hands fluttering wildly from the bed back to Howell's head as the other man licked around his nipple, before sucking it deep into his mouth. He hadn't realized that his breasts were so sensitive. He didn't usually play with them. They were just there. They were a way to help him feel like he was more like himself, a way to make him feel more comfortable on the outside the way he was on the inside. However, this, this right here, having howled between his legs, switching to his other nipple, biting down on it, plucking on the wet nipple he'd been playing with only seconds before, that went farther than any other type of surgery he could ever consider. Why was that? Why was the act of having sex with his mate so much more physically fulfilling to him than any other surgery in the world that he could ever have? Michael opened his eyes when Howell released his nipple and paused. What he saw there, what he saw in the cowboy's eyes, told him exactly why this felt so right to him. It was right there in front of him this whole time. Well, for the last hour or so. Acceptance. Howell accepted him, warts and all. The cowboy hadn't turned his back on him. He hadn't cast Michael away from him or called him a freak. He had accepted him. He admitted his attraction to him, and then he set out to show that attraction, to prove to Michael that he accepted him. Michael felt his heart squeeze and knew that he just might be in trouble. There was a definite chance that he was going to fall head over heels in love with his mate. Hard. Chapter 4 Michael felt his heart pounding furiously in his chest, the pure, wondrous emotion of joy, something he hadn't felt for years, almost choking off his oxygen, overwhelming him and filling his eyes with tears. With delight, he threw his arms around Howell's neck and pushed the other man over onto his back. Mashing his lips down onto his mates, Michael wiggled his body on top of the other man's much larger one. Oh, he sighed, his body feels just as good as it looks. Lifting his head, he grinned down at Howell and then licked and kissed his way down the other man's body. He felt his breasts swaying slightly before he pressed his chest down onto Howell's stomach and his lips to the other man's nipples. He felt Howell's hips jerk when he bit down onto the other man's dark brown nipple and grinned with satisfaction. Sticking out his tongue, he trailed it over Howell's pecs to his other nipple and flicked his tongue back and forth over the hardened nub before he bit down on the skin directly below it. Howell groaned, and Michael felt the rumble through his skin. Oh, he bet that was a lovely sound. The feeling was definitely amazing to his heightened senses. He swayed his body slowly left to right, letting his own hardened nipples graze the skin of his mate's stomach before he moved down slowly, his tongue following the path that his nipples had made only moments before. He licked his way through the black curls that surrounded his mate's impressive length and pressed his nose into the hair in order to inhale deeply. Oh, his mate's scent was intoxicating. Michael continued to inhale, rubbing his face in his mate's groin and the crease of his thigh and pelvis, allowing the other man's unique smell to completely cover him. He wanted to smell like his mate when they were done. He wanted to be marked, claimed, and possessed. It was something that he wanted with every fiber of his being, something that he craved with every cell of his body. A trail of wetness pressed against his cheek, and he turned his head and licked at the slit of his lover's cock, collecting the precom that had gathered there, the taste of his mate's desire exploding on his taste buds. Michael closed his eyes and shivered, his own cock jerking, and reached down and squeezed the base of his length to prevent himself from coming prematurely. He felt like he was back in high school with Justin Trackens, sneaking around and getting each other off in the bathrooms between classes. He would get off so quickly back then. It was partly the excitement of doing something that they weren't supposed to, and the fact that Justin was the first gay boy that he'd met in his extremely conservative high school. Well, Justin and Latroy Marshall. Michael shoved away thoughts of Latroy and returned his attention back to Howell. It was probably the height of rudeness to be thinking about his first love when he was with his mate. Grabbing Howell's cock in his right hand, he lifted the hardest steel shaft towards his mouth and lowered his mouth as far down as he could, which wasn't too far down the anaconda that was his mate's cock, and sucked with all of his might. He was determined to bring his mate to a shuddering orgasm that day, and if he had to suck his internal organs out through his cock, then Michael was driven to do so. 
Reaching a hand down to Howell's balls, Michael pulled his mouth off the top of his mate's cock and smacked his lips together in extreme happiness. Gods, his mate tasted delicious. Wanting more of Howell's addictive taste, Michael lowered his lips to the other man's balls and placed his mouth around one, his tongue grazing over the organ. He screamed when he found himself lifted high into the air and wrapped his arms and legs tightly around Howell's body as he quickly found himself on his back, being pressed down into the mattress, the head of Howell's cock pressing against the entrance to his ass. He tensed up almost instantly. It had been over six, no wait, Ten months since he'd been with anyone else. Ten months of only his dildo in his ass, and his favorite purple dildo was nowhere near the size of Howell's cock. What the hell? Did they even make dildos the same size of Howell's? He didn't think that they did. He watched as Howell reached towards his nightstand before stopping and looking down at him. Michael grinned up at his mate when he realized what the man was looking for. Reaching underneath the pillow that he lay on with his right hand, Michael grabbed onto the tube of lube that rested there and pulled it out. He handed it to Howell and exhaled deeply, giving his lover a tremulous smile. He knew that he was exuding the scent of fear and hesitation, but he really couldn't help it at that point. Closing his eyes, he released a deep breath as he reached mentally for the courage to relax and take his mate into his body. Expecting to feel his mate's finger or fingers in his ass, Michael's eyes flew open and he began twisting his body in shock and embarrassment as he instead felt the tip of his mate's tongue pressing against his puckered entrance. He panted and gripped the sheets of his bed in such a firm grip that he felt the fabric tearing beneath him. No one had ever done this to him, for him. He didn't know what the fascination was for his mate, putting his mouth and tongue on and in places that no one else ever had before, but Michael wholeheartedly approved. Reaching a hand down toward Howell's head, Michael was shocked to see that his hand had shifted in his bliss. That certainly explained how he was able to tear the sheets. Consciously shifting his hands back from his wolf paws, Michael put both of his hands on the back of his mate's head and pressed his ass more firmly towards the other man's mouth. He was still a little unsure about the whole having a tongue in his ass thing, but it was something that he'd mull over and debate with himself over much later. Right now, it felt way too wonderful to tell his mate to stop. Don't stop. Please, gods, don't stop, Michael pleaded with his mate in his mind. He wished that Howell could hear him, but when he felt his lover's large hands on his ass and spreading his cheeks further apart and shoving his tongue in deeper, he knew that while Howell hadn't heard him, He'd still known, on some telepathic level, that Michael was enjoying himself and didn't want him to stop. He barely registered the feeling of Howell's finger pressing into his ass, so focused was he on the tongue-lashing that he was getting. Oh, man, is this what I've been missing all of these years? An attentive lover who thinks every part of my body is a place to lick, kiss, and suck on? He wondered himself as he became distantly aware of Howell pressing a second finger deep into his hole. He shivered as he felt the tip of Howell's tongue trace around his clenching hole as the larger man pressed and withdrew his fingers slowly. Michael felt the moment that his hole stretched enough for Howell to press a third finger into his chute. His head pressed back into his pillow, his hips lifting off of the mattress and his back bowing as a pleasure so intense, so explosive swept through his veins. His limbs trembled and his mouth opened on a scream that never left his chest. Tears gathered in his eyes as Howell began pumping his fingers in and out of his ass quicker and harder. It was too much. The pleasure, the small bite of pain as Howell pressed a fourth finger in his ass was too much. He couldn't take any more. There was no way he could take any more pleasure. There was no way that he could feel any better without exploding into shards of Michael bits. He needed Howell to stop. He needed him to stop right now. Even with him thinking that, he knew that he whimpered when Howell pulled his fingers free, though he couldn't hear the sound. He opened his eyes to see what was wrong when his eyes alighted on the sight of Howell pouring a generous amount of lube onto his oversized cock. He was so far past gone at this moment that he could only spread his legs farther apart and reach out for his mate. He wanted Howell to fill him. He needed him to fill him. His skin felt too tight, his body was thrumming with desire, and his organs felt agitated. All of him was waiting for something, anything, to make the heightened awareness, the tension, leave his body. He felt as if he were about to self-combust. He couldn't think. He couldn't begin to sign, write, or impart to his mate the enormity of what he was feeling. 
and so it was with extreme relief and satisfaction when he felt Howell's cock press against his guardian muscle. Gods, yes, please, oh gods, please, please, please fill me, he sobbed mentally, desperation for his mate overwhelming his senses. Exhaling deeply in an attempt to relax his body fully, he felt a few tears escape his eyes when the head of his mate's cock popped into it. He looked up at Hal and was amazed to see that his large mate had tears in his eyes as well. Knowing that he didn't want to wait another minute to hear his mate's voice in his head, didn't want to wait another second for their souls to connect and join, Michael tilted his head to the side to bare his neck to his other half. He hissed and pressed down deeper onto his mate's cock when Hal leaned over him to lick at the side of his neck. A swirl of colors flashed across his eyes as he felt Hal's canine sink into the base of his neck and mark him. He wrapped and squeezed his thighs around Hal's waist, his fingers pressing deeply into his man's back as his body quivered and heated to boiling from the inside out with the force of his orgasm. His sperm shot from the tip of his cock with force, splattering his chest and some of it landing on both his chin and Hal's. He was distantly aware of Hal's cock, the anaconda battering ram, as he'd renamed it, still pounding away furiously into his hole. Fuck, shit, damn, he yelled out in his head, and for the first time heard the most beautiful sound ever, the sound of his mate's voice. Like smooth velvet over a deep bass, it filled his mind and flowed through his body. God damn it, you feel so fucking good, baby. Unexpectedly, Michael felt the muscles in his ass squeeze his mate's cock as he exploded in another orgasm, on the heels of his first one. He felt Hal gently slide his teeth from his neck and lick the wound closed as he continued to ram his cock deeper and deeper into his ass. Michael pressed his hands against the headboard as he began to shove his ass back down onto Hal's cock, his heart near bursting as he felt his man freeze and heard the roar in their mating link as well as he felt the hard rumble in Hal's body as the bigger man threw his head back as his body exploded in an orgasm. Michael reveled in the rush of heat that flooded his insides. He knew that if he'd been a woman, there was no way he wouldn't have gotten pregnant from the copious amount of seed that his mate had just released into his ass. He barely stifled a giggle at the thought of a man being pregnant, of him being pregnant, and instead wrapped his arms and legs tighter around his mate, sighing when Hal turned to rest on his back. He snuggled closer to this man, who was now his future, and shivered when he felt Hal's softened cock slip from his ass moments later. He wanted to stay awake so that he could talk to the other man, so that they could get to know each other better. But as the edges of his vision began to go dark, he knew that it was a futile hope. He stopped fighting the feeling and slipped into the first truly peaceful sleep he'd had in years. Chapter 5 Howell woke up and felt his muscles tense almost immediately. He was in bed with someone. They were wrapped around him almost like an octopus or a spider. Whoever the stranger was, their head was pressing against his chest, the top of the blonde head resting just underneath his chin. He inhaled deeply, struggling to remember where he was, and felt his wolf calm instantly as the enchanting smell of his mate washed over him. Michael he thought with a satisfied smile and felt the other man stir at the sound of his name through their mental link. He lifted the sheet that covered them both and admired his mate's pink, petal-like skin. Hmm, his groan rumbled in his chest, vibrating underneath the very place Michael's head lay. Lifting up the sheet with one hand, he ran the tips of his fingers over Michael's side. He watched in fascination as goosebumps appeared along the skin of the petite man. Tossing the sheet back towards the foot of the bed, he smoothed his hand along Michael's shoulder, down the smaller man's arm and up to the hand that rested on his left shoulder. He could spend the rest of his life touching his mate's supple skin and never get bored. And I could spend the rest of my life letting you touch me and never get bored, Michael said to him through their mating link, before tilting his head back and smiling up at him. Howell grinned down at his man, his mate and lowered his head down to kiss the other man's full lips. The taste of his mate, a delightful blend of peaches, colgate, and morning breath, something Hal never thought he'd find arousing, along with the softness of his lips, caused his already burgeoning erection to thicken and harden to the point that he could pound nails if he needed to. 
With a low growl, he lifted Michael into his arms and shivered when his cock rubbed against the puckered hole of Michael's ass. It was in that moment, just before he was about to enter his mate's ass once again, that he froze. Wait, why can I hear you? he asked Michael, confusion filling his body and causing his muscles to lock as he stared up at his beautifully naked and completely aroused mate. What? Michael responded, leaning over to kiss him. Howell turned his head and flipped the smaller man over until he was on top of him. Only alphas and their mates can hear each other, so why can I hear you? Why did I know that as soon as we made it I'd be able to hear you? Hal knew he was babbling, and he knew that he wasn't exactly being very cool in that moment, but he didn't care. Something fishy was going down, and he didn't particularly care for fish, even if he was from the Caribbean. Okay, now he wasn't making sense to himself. He was really losing it. Hal, calm down. We have a mating link we can talk through because you're an alpha, aren't you? Or you're a descendant of an alpha who stepped down? Michael reasoned with him. Hal shook his head no frantically climbing out of the bed and pacing the floors. He was just a cowboy. That was it. Period. End of story. He was at most a gamma for the tape pack. Tun was the beta. He was the one who would take over if something happened to Vet. Then again, Tun had once told him about his father's uncle, who was an alpha of a pack out in Washington somewhere. So Tun would either take over for Vet, or he would go on to lead his uncle's pack if that man ever passed away. Even then, Howell was third in line for the position of alpha for the tape pack. There was no way that he could be an alpha, unless... Every time that I've ever dreamed of you, you were an alpha. I could tell. I could feel your power, your position, and your strength through the images. I knew that my mate was an alpha, and you're my mate, so you're an alpha. How do you not know this? Howell heard Michael's soft voice in his head, and he felt a ball of grief so big, so hard, fill his entire frame. His father was dead. How is that even possible? His father, Fitzgerald Marshall, was invincible. He was the bravest, strongest man that Howell knew. There was no way that he could have died. He didn't know of anyone who was strong enough to defeat his father. No one. He tried to reason with himself and knew a moment of extreme heartache so strong that he felt his legs shake. He was aware of Michael climbing out of the bed quickly and walking towards him. He even knew that his mate had wrapped his arms around him. None of it registered, however. Even if his father had died and the mantle of Alpha had passed to him, there was no way that he could go and claim the title or the position. He was, for all intents and purposes, dead to his biological pact. Being dead to the pact, but not really dead in reality, meant that while the power of being an Alpha ran through his veins, the responsibility would never be his. He wasn't too sure how he felt about that. He wasn't too sure how he felt about anything. Would he be able to go to the funeral? Had they already had the funeral? Was his mother still alive? How had his father died? What about his grandmother, Mary? Was she still alive? These questions swirled around in his mind, causing a maelstrom of chaotic images to flash in his mind, resulting in an upheaval of emotions that he barely managed to push Michael away in time to rush off to the bathroom and the toilet to expel the contents of his stomach. His father was dead, and all he could think of was getting back home, back to Texas back to Tate Ranch and the Tate Pack. Home. He needed to get home. Michael stared at Howell in shock. His mate had completely fallen off of the deep end. It was the only explanation for why he'd just said what he'd said to him. I'm sorry you said I'm coming with you where? he asked, hoping that he was accurately conveying his disbelief. Texas. Wichita Falls, Texas, to be more precise. Hal told him, though the man hadn't looked at him since returning from the bathroom. He was trying really hard not to feel insulted or upset that his mate was practically ignoring him, but it was kind of hard not to feel that way when said mate refused to acknowledge his presence. Had they really only met the day before? In that moment, he felt as if Howell had been annoying, ignoring and trying to completely control his life for years. Decades. Fucking centuries. Michael turned and picked up the pillow that sat on the bed and lobbed it at Howell's head, feeling a bloom of satisfaction spread through his chest when it connected soundly with the back of the other man's head. He watched as his mate froze his motions and felt fear course through his veins. His mate wouldn't hurt him, right? Right. In all of the dreams that he'd been having about Howell, he'd never once gotten the feeling that his mate was dangerous. Not once. 
Well, okay, not violent towards him. That whole being an alpha thing pretty much guaranteed that Howell would rip another shifter apart if he felt that he really had to. Michael could only hope that being hit in the back of the head with a pillow didn't warrant a need for his mate to be violent. I would never hurt you, Michael. I hope you know that, he heard Hal sigh through their link. Look, there's a lot about my family, my past, my whole fucking history that you don't know. And I'm going to tell you everything, I promise. But, you know, this whole shifter mates thing isn't really conducive to getting to know each other first. So I'm going to need you to give me a little bit of time to get my head together. Just know if I tell you we need to go somewhere, then we need to go somewhere, and I need to get back to Wichita Falls as soon as possible. Michael could feel his mate's dark emotions pressing against him, and he gasped and clutched the coverlet as the anger, grief, despair, hopelessness, fear, and revenge all rolled over him. Why the hell was his mate seeking revenge? Against who? For what? What the holy fucking hell was going on? I get that, Hal, I do, but I need something more than just you need to go back to Wichita Falls. I can't just uproot my life here, leave my job, my home, my sister, because you want me to. Look at this from my point of view, please. I want to be with you. You're my mate. I was made to be with you, but I'm the one being asked, or rather told, to move, and you're not even asking me if I'm okay with it or if I'm afraid or, hell, even if I like Texas. This is a partnership. You're just as much my mate as I am yours. Michael waited for Hal's response with bated breath. It was the longest tirade that he'd ever given anyone, usually sticking with his patented kiss-my-toe-and-suck-my-ass jab whenever someone was being a complete ass to him. He knew that Howell wasn't doing it deliberately. He also knew that if he didn't stop the man from doing it now, he would spend the rest of his life being controlled by someone else. He'd spent enough time in someone else's clutches. His father, Alfred Prasace, was the asshole of every wolf pack, past, present, and future. He'd raised and trained his children to act and behave a certain way. Michael had conformed for a time, but finally decided to live his life on his terms. He loved his freedom. He adored his independence. He wasn't going to give that up for anyone, not even his mate. He ran the fingers of his right hand through his hair as Howell continued to sit facing away from him, not speaking and no longer moving. He didn't know what was going on with his mate but if he agreed to go with the other man to a place that sounded a lot like Witches All Fall, Texas, then he was going to make sure that his curiosity was satisfied to a certain degree. He reached forward and lightly touched Howell's shoulder and felt the moment when the man relaxed. This was what he wanted, what he needed. He needed for Howell to relax, to calm down, and to tell him what had happened only thirty minutes before to cause such a reaction in him. He had an ache in his stomach, one that let him know that he probably wasn't going to like what his mate was going to tell him, but whatever he was told, he knew it would be something he needed to hear. When the last of the tension left Hal's frame, Michael shuffled forward on his knees, the embroidered leaves on the coverlet scratching and upbraiding the skin as he made his way closer to his mate. He sat behind the grieving man and wrapped his arms around him. Oh, man, the anger and grief that surrounded his mate was making him ill. What in the world was his man keeping from him? He opened his mouth to question Howell again about why he needed to leave so quickly when he saw the light over his door begin to flash rapidly. Katharina was knocking on his door and she was upset. Howell tensed in his arms and Michael could feel the growl that rumbled through his mate's chest. He wanted to curl up in the other man's lap and reassure him that he was okay, but he had to see what was wrong with his sister. He'd seen her briefly the night before, when he'd stepped out of his room to get some food for he and Hal, and they'd both gushed and giggled over how extremely sexy Michael's mate was. She'd gone out shortly after, telling him that she wanted to go and hang out with a friend of hers. Michael only smiled and winked at her at the time. He knew where she was going and who the friend was. Katharina thought he didn't know about her beautiful Latina girlfriend that she went to the strip club to see, but he knew. He'd seen the other woman. He believed that Katharina called her Rose. He'd seen her leaving early one morning. He was happy for his sister. He'd be much happier if Rose was his sister's mate, however. Then he wouldn't feel so horrible for even considering the prospect of leaving her in Las Vegas while he went to Texas with Hal. Rubbing Howell's chest until the vibrations beneath his hand stopped, Michael kissed the thick neck of his mate and quickly slid off the bed to rush to the door. He jerked it open and quickly signed to his sister. What the hell is wrong with you? 
he asked her, annoyed that she wasn't bleeding or gasping for breath. Was she only knocking to be nosy? He wouldn't put it past her. Dad's here, she signed back. Rose saw him in town asking about us. We have about an hour to pack up and get the fuck out of town before he catches us. We've got to get back to Georgia and help the Marshall pack before he attacks again. Chapter 6 Howell grabbed his head as images of Noel and Latroy rushed through his mind. His head pounded as memories of them, the last time that he saw them alive, flashed through his brain. Suddenly one image appeared, hazy at first, then sharpening until it was completely clear in his mind. A young boy, Caucasian, with blonde hair and pretty blue eyes, his friend, Mikey. They had spent the summers in Georgia playing together. Mikey had been his first kiss when they were seven. He had written a letter to Mikey and told him that they were going to get married some day when he was eight. He couldn't remember Mikey completely, but he did remember that he and Mikey had spent a lot of time writing letters to each other. Mikey had been a year behind him, and he had felt as if he were Mikey's protector, even until the very end. Howell felt the muscles in his body clench and stretch as more memories resurfaced. Memories he'd buried with Latanya's death, people he'd forced himself to forget. He felt the wetness on his cheeks before he even realized he was crying. He heard footsteps rushing towards him and felt the arms of his mates surrounding him, smelled his scent, something that was distinctly Michael and just a trace of his own scent. It soothed him, calmed his tense muscles, and brought forth more memories. He shivered as ice filled his veins as the memory of the night Latanya went missing washed over his senses. He'd just turned ten, and there was a party going on inside of the house, but he'd been sad because his parents had told him that Mikey couldn't come to the party, so he'd gone outside to sulk. He'd felt someone throw something at his head, and when he'd turned his head, he'd seen Mikey standing there in a pink shirt that had obviously belonged to his older sister, Cat, a pair of dark blue jeans, and he'd been leaning against a tree in the yard of the Marshall family home in his bare feet. Howell remembered how happy he'd been to see Mikey. He remembered how he'd wanted to do nothing more than grab Mikey's hand and run away with him. Even at the age of ten, he'd known what he wanted and had been determined to get it, no matter what the cost. He'd been walking towards Mikey when he'd heard his aunt scream. The blood-curdling scream had frozen him in his tracks. He'd turned his head towards the house when the lights had all turned on brightly. He knew that something bad had happened, and he knew, in some distant wise part of himself, that if his family found Mikey there at that moment, they would hurt him. He'd run towards Mikey, his feet slapping against the cool grass of the yard. He'd ignored the sharp jagged edges of the rocks that cut his feet and the dirt that buried itself into those same cuts as he headed straight towards his friend. Lifting his hands, he'd signed for Mikey to leave, to go back to the Prasace house and to not look back no matter what that he had to go right then. Wait, he'd signed? Hal's eyes snapped open, and he stared at Michael in shock. He saw the tears in his mate's eyes, and knew that the grief that he saw in the smaller man's gaze directly mirrored his own. Mikey? Michael's eyes slid open, and he shook slightly. Hal sat up quickly and pulled his mate, his Mikey, into his arms. How was this possible? How is it feasible that his fated mate was Mikey, the same little boy he'd fallen in love with when he was just a child himself? This is all really touching, but our father is here, and we now have about half an hour to grab as much as we can and get the hell out of here, Katharina said to him, fear and anger lacing her words. Howell stiffened at her words. He wouldn't run. There was no way he would tuck tail and leave town just because the same man who had so oppressed his mate and his mate's sister had come to the city. He would stay and confront the man who had terrorized his little man. He would protect Michael and Katharina both. It was his job. Why should I run? I'm not afraid of your father. I doubt he even remembers me. Hal pointed out to Katharina, watching as she signed to Michael. You have to run with us, Hal. You have to come back to Georgia to warn your family, or he's going to do what he did to Latanya, Latroy, and Noel to someone else, Katharina told him her blue eyes unwavering in their gaze as they captured his. Howell felt his breath lock in his chest. What the hell did Michael's father have to do with Latanya, and what the fuck had happened to Noel and Latroy? Later, Howell, please. We need to go, and we need to go now, Michael pleaded with him, and Howell looked down in the desperate gaze of his mate and gave him a quick nod. He'd go with them now because he had to protect his mate, 
but they would give him the answers he sought, and since they were driving all the way to Georgia, they would be able to give him the whole story. Michael couldn't stop shaking. He wasn't sure if it was just the fear of his father being in the same city as him and his mate, or if it was the rush of memories that had rushed through Howell's mind, and by extension his own. How is it possible that his Howell was the same H. L. Marshall that he'd been so hopelessly in love with as a kid? He didn't know whether to shout out with happiness at the ingenuity of the fates or to yell out in despair. His being mated to a member of the Marshall Pack was so far beyond bad that it was an epic, massive, universal fail. He looked over at Howell as the other man rushed around the room, shoving his clothes and other hearing assistance devices into bags and suitcases with no concern for order. He understood the need for haste, he really did, but reality had finally caught up with his mind and he'd just realized how truly fucked they all truly were. He grabbed his hoodie from Tumblr and Tipsy and clutched it to his chest before pulling it on. Reaching his hands into the drawer of his dresser, he pulled out every article of clothing that he had from that brand and turned to face Hal. He'd spent too much money buying every single article of clothing that he could get from them for him to not take them with him. He saw Hal look from him to the clothes in his arms, to the already stuffed bags and suitcases. He knew that he was being irrational. He knew that he was barely holding back a panic attack. But he didn't care in that moment. He was going to take his clothes with him. All of his clothes. He smelled Katharina walk up behind him and then saw the suitcase that she tossed to Howell and his face burned slightly with shame. His sister had to pack as well and she had a lot more stuff to worry about rather than catering to his childish tantrum. He turned to thank her and saw she merely smiled at him before racing out of the room. Okay, Mikey, put the clothes in the suitcase and let's get the hell out of here, Hal told him and Michael moved without hesitation towards his mate. He shoved the clothes into the suitcase and slammed the locks closed. He grabbed the handle of one suitcase with his right hand and picked up another suitcase with his left hand, the frayed edges of the handle digging into his hand. He took a shuddering breath and looked up at Hal, who'd come to stand before him. I may not know exactly what's going on, but I am giving you my word that I will protect you with every ounce of strength that I have, and I will not stop until I take my last breath, Hal assured him, lightly stroking the skin of Michael's cheek with his fingers. Michael shivered at the tender caress, his skin tingling once Hal dropped his hand. He did not deserve this man. He really didn't. That didn't mean that he wasn't going to do everything in his power to keep him. More than that, he was going to do everything in his power to keep him safe. Going up on his toes, Michael placed a soft kiss on his mate's full lips and turned to leave the room. They met Katharina in the living room, where she stood surrounded by bags and suitcases of her own. She gave him a small smile and lifted her hands to sign. He waved her off. They didn't have time to talk. They needed to go and go now. He trailed behind her as she took off down the stairs, feeling the heavy pounding of his mate's footsteps directly behind him. The bigger man's cloying scent wrapping around him in a tight embrace even as his presence pushed Michael to rush behind Katharina. We're taking my truck. I'm sure that your sister's car's bugged or he's identified it. He doesn't know my truck. Hal rationalized to him and Michael assumed that he'd verbally told Katharina because she froze in her trek forward almost immediately and turned to allow Hal to lead the way. The three of them pushed their ways through the patrons of the coffee shop and out the front door. Michael sniffed the air. No trace of his father in the air, but a feeling of dread settling on his shoulders. If his father wasn't there now, then he was definitely close and getting closer. They had to hurry, or they'd be out of time. Hal, my father's close. I don't know how I know, but I do. We have to hurry. He conveyed to his mate and sighed with happiness and relief when the other man began to jog towards his truck that was parked on the side of the building. They all tossed their suitcases and bags into the truck, taking a little bit of extra care with the fragile items, but still moving quickly. At any other time, Michael would have admired his mate's truck, but at this point in time, he just couldn't do it. He swung open the door to the cab of the truck and pulled the seat up, allowing his sister to climb into the back seat. Once she settled, he pushed the passenger seat back into position and jumped into the seat, before slamming the door shut. He buckled his seat belt and then turned to look out the back window in fear when he realized that Howell wasn't in the driver's seat. He breathed easier, only slightly, when he saw that Howell was covering their bags and suitcases with a tarp. He began bouncing in the seat slightly when time passed and Howell was still fighting with the tarp. What the hell was wrong with his mate? It was just material shit. Howell, get your ass in the truck right now. That's all material bullshit. We can replace it. I can't replace you, though. Please, please get in the truck so that we can go. 
Michael pleaded with his mate and breathed a sigh of relief when Hal finished tying off the tarp and jumped into the driver's seat and cranked up the vehicle. He backed the truck out of its parking spot quickly, and then with a turn of the wheel, peeled out of the parking lot and down the road. Michael's hands clenched as he continued to check the mirrors to see if they were being followed. He could see that his sister was doing the same, and wondered if Hal was going to think that they were some paranoid freaks in a moment. He knew that Hal didn't remember exactly how evil Michael's father was when they were children, but Michael would never forget the black sludge that flowed through his father's veins instead of blood or the black hunk of rock that sat in his chest that had obviously replaced his heart, if the man ever had one. Michael couldn't remember his father ever being kind and generous to anyone, not even their mother, his wife, his supposed mate. Michael had questioned his father once, and only once, about why he was so mean to everyone, and his father had told him that it was because the world was full of stupid and idiotic people, and that he'd been put on the earth to straighten them all out. That was before he'd dragged Michael outside and made him kneel in front of the tree out in the backyard with his hands tied behind his back and a rope wrapped around his neck, and the tree that he knelt in front of. Michael had been six. He'd met Hal shortly after that, though the other man had introduced himself as H. L. Marshall at the time, and that's what Michael had called him the whole time they'd been together as kids, H. L. And he'd introduced himself as Mikey. It was the name that he'd allowed his mother and his sister to call him because he loved them. He'd fallen in love with H.L., or Hal, the first time he'd seen him. That apparently hadn't changed. Michael looked over at Hal as the other man maneuvered the truck in and out of traffic, his jaw clenched and his hands squeezing the steering wheel. Michael's eyes locked onto the sight of those fingers clenching and releasing the wheel, and he felt his body flush with desire. Probably not the wisest time to be getting aroused, and he was pretty sure that it was probably also due to the running for their lives and getting away with it thing, but he couldn't help the fact that he was majorly turned on at that point. He saw Hal stiffen, and then grin from his seat next to him, and Michael knew his mate had smelled his arousal. He clasped his hands together tightly in an effort not to reach over for his man, especially not with his sister being in the car with him. He nibbled on his bottom lip and turned his head to look out at the scenery that flashed by as they sped along south down the NV-604 towards US-93 into Arizona. Gods, Michael hadn't ever wanted to see this stretch of highway ever again. Especially not when he was once again running from his father. He was so tired of running. Okay now. Hal's voice sounded in his mind, and Michael felt his entire body shiver as the deep, sensual sound of his mate's tone rolled over his body. Hearing his mate's voice through their mating link was so personal and so intimate. He already got supremely aroused just hearing Hal's voice in his head. He was selfishly glad that he couldn't hear his voice audibly. He would be a walking orgasm if he could. How about you tell me what the fuck is going on with Mikey? Did you know that we knew each other as kids? Where the hell are Latroy and Noel? What do you know about Latanya? And why, for fuck's sake, am I headed back to Georgia when, for all my pack knows, I died over two decades ago? Chapter 7 The night of your birthday party, I remember being angry that I'd been told by my mother that I wasn't able to go. I'd run off from my room and pounded for a while. Then Kat told me that she'd cover for me if I wanted to go and see you for a little while so I climbed out of the window to come over and see you. Michael began, and Howell felt some of the tension that held the muscles in his body so taut slowly begin to ease and loosen at his mate's words. It was a relief to know that Michael had been just as anxious to see him that night. He may be slowly regaining his memory of events, but the feelings that came with those memories were quick to make themselves known and felt. Howell wasn't too sure how he felt about his mate now, but he for sure remembered how he felt about him then. I was so happy to see you that you were outside by the time I got there. I was happy that the land between our houses bordered each other so I could come over to see you that night. I was elated when I saw you look at me and get that big-ass grin on your face. It made me feel special. Like you actually liked me. Like you cared, Michael admitted to him. Howell felt his eyes sting slightly at the feeling of hope Warring with loneliness washed over his senses through their mating link. Gods, what had his mate endured at the hands of his father and his pack? Why did this beautiful man feel as if he'd been honored, given a special priceless jewel because someone cared for him? 
Michael deserved to be cared for, and loved, and spoiled. Howell could remember the sweet boy he was then, and could sense the caring man he was now. People that were that amazing, that loving and caring, that giving, those people were priceless and deserving of the greatest things that life had to offer. Howell could see to it that Michael got those things. Contingent upon if he and his sister were completely innocent of any wrong against his family, of course. You came running towards me, and I remember how happy I was that you were so happy to see me. Then you started signing to me, telling me that I had to leave, that it wasn't safe for me to be there, telling me to run and not look back. I didn't want to leave you if something bad was happening, but you made me. We hugged and you kissed me on the lips. Do you remember that? Michael asked him, and Howell's mind flashed with the image of him pressing his lips to Michael's. How innocent he was then. How innocent they both were. That night had been the night that his life began to change forever. It seemed as if the same thing could be said for Michael as well. Howell nodded to Michael to let him know that he remembered, not trusting either his mental voice nor his physical one to relay his thoughts and feelings properly at that moment. I did exactly what you told me to do, H.L., Michael reassured him, using the nickname that Howell had used when they were kids. Hearing that name filled him with warmth, and he fought back the urge to grin at hearing the name. He would smile later. He would smile after his sister and cousin had been found. He would smile when Latanya got justice. When I got home and climbed back up into my window, Kat was so scared and freaked out, she'd overheard my mother yelling at my father, asking him why he would do something, screaming and crying at him, calling him a monster. We both crept down the hallway to the top of the stairs so that we could hear them better. Mom asked Dad how in the world she was supposed to look Valerie, your mother, in the face ever again, knowing that her husband had kidnapped and killed her niece. Howell felt his heart stutter in his chest, and his hands trembled as he jerked the car over to the side of the road. What the hell? Howell, why the fuck did we stop? Katharina yelled at him. With a low, feral growl, Howell turned to her. He could feel the rage thrumming through his veins. His wolf pounded at his senses, desperate to get free, seeking revenge for the affront done to his family. A member of his pack had been brutalized, and Hal wanted blood. Did you know? he asked Katharina, hearing how low and growly his voice was, aware of just how close he was to shifting. In that moment, at that time, he didn't care. He didn't care if he shifted in front of the entire country. He wanted answers, and he wanted the full story right then. He watched as Katharina swallowed nervously and then nodded. She signed for Michael as she answered his question, and Howell wondered when he'd forgotten how to sign. When had he lost the knowledge and the ability to do that? Was it after Latanya went missing? When Latanya's body was found? Or perhaps it was the moment that his family had sent him away for his own safety? Howell wasn't bitter about that, or even angry about it. Nope. Not one bit. When you introduced yourself as Howell Lures Marshall, that's when I knew. I remembered how you and Michael used to play together as kids. I remembered how upset he was that he couldn't go to your party. Then I remembered the night that I helped him sneak out and what happened afterwards. I didn't know what to tell you. I didn't know how to tell you. She sighed, and Howell could smell the confusion and the truth as it oozed from the pores of her skin. I felt ashamed. I felt guilty. I was so fucking scared that you were going to blame me or Michael. But more than that, she stopped and gave Michael a watery smile before looking back at Howell, who was barely holding on to his visceral response to the information. I was happy, she admitted to him. Happy? Why the fuck would your sister be happy about what happened to my family? To Latanya? To me? Howell asked Michael, barely able to open his mouth to ask Katharina. I was happy because it meant that you weren't dead, that my father hadn't killed you, and that you and Michael were together again, or would be. He was never as happy as he was when he was with you, not even when he and Latroy dated in high school. He still wasn't as happy. I was happy that you were alive, and happy that you are big enough, strong enough, alpha enough, to be able to stop my father once and for all. Howell heard Katharina's words, and they did go a long way towards calming him down a bit. But one part of her statement locked in his brain, and as he pulled back onto the highway, 
he picked up his conversation with his mate. You dated my cousin Latroy? Michael was going to kill his sister. Why in the name of all that was holy would she tell his mate that Michael had dated his cousin? Was she trying to get them killed? She was obviously trying to get them killed. In high school I met Latroy. He looked familiar, but I couldn't really place him. You and I had played with each other away from everyone else, so every glimpse I ever had of him was distant. He told me what pack he was from, and I immediately apologized for my father. I'd known there was no evidence to link my father to the crime, and since I'm deaf, everything that I knew or had heard was all considered hearsay, from Cat to me by the police when I went to report him. Latroy understood that, and we began working on trying to get some dirt, some information on my father and what he'd done. We were trying to find some way to make him pay for his actions. We ended up dating and falling in love in the process. He smelled almost like my mate, but not quite. He told me that I didn't smell anything like his mate at all, and so we dated with the understanding that we were only together until one of us found our mate. When we graduated high school, we went to two different colleges. We tried to keep in touch, but it didn't work. Then Latroy found his mate, fell in love, had his son, and I let him go. I thought he was my first love after you, H.L. I see now that my wolf was merely trying to substitute him for you. Michael could tell that Hal was confused by his words, and he wondered what he could have possibly said to bring that look of intense concentration and confusion to his lover's face. He'd explained everything. He told Hal everything that he knew. So why did he look so heartbroken, so upset? Latroy was kept in Georgia. Noel and I were placed in foster homes in different states. She was sent to Virginia to live, and I was sent to Texas, the farthest away from my family, my pack. I can't believe they let Latroy stay in Georgia. Michael could hear the despair and the underlying anger in his mate's voice and felt guilt slash through him, causing his breath to catch in his lungs. He knew that it was irrational. He hadn't done anything to cause his mate's misfortune. He was just as much a victim as Howell was. That didn't lift the burden of guilt that rested on his shoulders, however. Reaching over towards Howell's hands that now gripped the steering wheel with an almost choking grasp, then lightly touched the skin of the back of his lover's hand. He ran a finger over the veins that he could see protruding there. Howell's skin was slightly dry but still silky smooth, in spite of the work that he did. What exactly did Howell do anyway? Michael felt his eyebrows pull down into a frown as he realized that he didn't really know anything about his mate. He knew the things that he'd known when they were kids. He knew that he currently lived in Wichita Falls, Texas, with another pack. But what did he do for work? What did he like to do for fun? What was his favorite color? Favorite food? Hell, what was his favorite position? These were all things that Michael would have gotten a chance to know about Hal if they'd had the chance to grow up with each other as they'd originally planned to do. Things that they would have learned about each other if they weren't running for their lives from a man who should be supporting their union. What's your favorite color? He asked Hal, and he could feel his mate's shock at the unexpected question floating through their link. He turned and saw the moment that Howell looked at him out of the corner of his eye. Michael felt the shiver that ran up his spine and bit his lower lip hard in an effort to stop the groan that he could feel wanting to rumble up from his chest. He didn't understand this. He'd known other couples who were mated, and they'd never shared with him that when they'd gotten mated they'd had an overwhelming urge to be continuously tied to their mate, to always be joined to them, always having sex with them, always touching or kissing them. Was this something that only he could suffer from because he was such a freak? Was this because he couldn't decide exactly what gender he wanted to be? This morning he'd woken up and felt considerably manly, but just yesterday he'd felt womanly. There definitely had to be something wrong with him. What other wolf-shifter out there was as fucked up as him? Michael was shocked out of his musings when Howell's right hand gripped his left one and pressed it against the hard ridge of his erection pressing against the zipper of his jeans. Michael looked down at the sight of his mate's obvious state of arousal and then looked up at him, confusion swamping his senses. Why was Howell so aroused? And dear gods in heaven, why was it suddenly so hot in the truck? You are not fucked up. You are not a freak. You are my mate. Mine. You are beautiful. You turn me on just by looking at me, just by touching me. 
just by breathing my air. If I weren't driving this truck right now and we weren't running for our lives, I'd have you bent over the front of this truck with my cock shoved so far up your ass that it was coming out of your mouth. Unfortunately, I can't do anything about it right now. But hold on to that thought, because as soon as we get a chance to stop, I'm going to take you into a bathroom and fuck you so hard that you're going to be screaming my name. Al promised him, his voice low and growly in Michael's mind. Michael swallowed thickly, feeling the moan that rumbled up from his chest and very aware of the wet spot that appeared on the front of his jeans. Oh, his mate was devious, evil, and so fucking hot. I think I'm hungry, Hal. Maybe we can stop for breakfast or lunch or something. Chapter 8 Hal pulled up in front of a roadside diner in Flagstaff and sighed deeply. His life had completely changed in the last forty-eight hours. Wow, had it only been two days since he'd met his mate and then found out said mate was the little boy he'd been in love with as a kid? And now they were on the run from his mate's father, who was directly or indirectly responsible for the murder of his cousin Latanya, and the reason his sister Noel and other cousin Latroy were missing. He was beginning to think that there was definitely some weird type of bad tape pack mojo following him around or something. While finding Michael definitely wasn't a bad thing, the rest of it was a major shitstorm. His chest rose and fell with another deep sigh, and he removed the key from the ignition and turned to observe the other passengers in the car. Katharina looked disheveled and paranoid, her blue eyes darting back and forth out of the windows as if she expected her father to pull up in his car directly behind them. Her hands continuously clutched and released the back of the seat that she sat on, and Hal knew that he needed to get her something to calm her down. He wondered if she drank or smoked. He didn't smoke, but he was pretty sure that he could find someone to sell them some weed if it came down to it. You are not going to give my sister drugs, Michael's voice sounded in his head, sounding shocked that Hal would even think such a thing. Hal snorted and turned to look at his mate. He was the biggest shock for sure. Michael was beautiful. He was all sweet, softness, fluff, and sexiness all rolled into one. Al wasn't sure if he wanted to wrap him in bubble wrap to keep him safe, or if he wanted to tie him up to a bed and have his wicked way with him. I guess that makes you rough, huh? Michael teased him, and Hal chuckled, realizing that he'd sent those thoughts to his mate. Yeah, I guess we're fluff and rough, he teased back, before finally opening the door and sliding out of the truck. Stepping down in his brown cowboy boots, he hissed as he felt the sharp stab of pain in the top plane of his foot as he did. With the pain came the flash of memory with it. He'd been running, away from his parents towards someone. The flash of blue eyes gave him his answer. He'd been trying to get back to Mikey. A large gray wolf had appeared out of nowhere and chased him, biting his foot as he'd attempted to leap over a log. When he'd fallen to the ground, the wolf had shifted back to his human form. Standing over him was an older white man, his lips pulled back in a snarl. Stay away from my son, you black perversion, the man had said, before turning around and shifting back to his wolf form and running away. Hal hadn't known about shifting then, hadn't even had his first shift by that point, so he'd limped back home and had only been able to tell his parents that it was an old white wolf man who had bitten his foot. He'd been nine at the time. It had been the last time that his parents had allowed him to freely go and see Mikey. The two of them had been forced to sneak around after that. Howell was jerked out of his memory by the sound of his mate's cry of dismay. His head snapped towards Michael, and he saw tears streaking down his lover's beautiful pale cheeks. Howell rushed towards him and pulled the smaller man into his arms. My father bit you? He warned you away from me when we were still kids? Why would he do that? Michael asked, and Howell felt fury rise inside of him. I don't know why, baby, but we'll figure this whole thing out. I promise. He reassured his man, kissing his temple before he gently wiped away the tears on the other man's face and placed a small kiss on his lips, and, taking him by the hand, led him towards the diner door where Katharina stood waiting for them. Owl smiled at the slim woman and gestured for her to precede him into the restaurant. He followed Michael inside the diner and found that the three of them were instantly the center of attention. More than used to having people staring at him, having grown up black in the South, 
Hal smiled a feral grin at the other customers and gave a low rumbling growl that he felt throughout his entire body as he put his arm around Michael's waist. His words and intention very clear. If anyone wanted to fuck with Michael or Katharina, they would have to go through him first. He smiled at the young waitress who came rushing towards them, tightening his arm around Michael slightly when he smelled the distinct scent of elf on the stranger. As he looked closer at the young woman, he realized that the stranger was exactly like Michael. Not entirely man, yet not entirely woman, either. He could feel the tension that had gripped Michael's frame ease as he realized the exact same thing that he did. Not only was the elf fluid, like Michael, but they could definitely scent a curse on her. Him. Hi, my name's Janessa. Everyone calls me Ginny or Jin or Nessa. You know, whatever floats your boat and cranks your tractor. Are all three of y'all together? The elf asked them, and Hal felt himself relax completely at the friendliness in her tone. Yeah, can we get a booth, please? Hal requested. Sure thing. Is that your partner? Janessa asked as she led them to a table. Hal was very proud of himself for not staring at her large breasts that bounced as she turned to face him. Damn, what the fuck was wrong with him? He'd never been particularly fascinated with breasts before mating Michael, but now that he had, he found himself checking out boobs and cocks. Did that make him bisexual? He shuddered as he thought of sleeping with a woman and shoving his cock there, and heard Michael chuckle beside him as they got settled into a booth at the back of the diner. He felt his cheeks burn when he realized that he'd once again projected his thoughts to his mate. How the hell was he supposed to control that? He didn't want to be walking around telling his mate every single thought. What if he was trying to keep a secret from him, like a birthday present or something? You have to imagine a wall or a bubble when there's something that you don't want me to know. Just imagine that you've put that wall or bubble up and it will keep your thoughts from flooding my head all the time. Even though I've sort of enjoyed knowing your every thought, Michael informed him. Hal grinned as he looked down at his mate sitting next to him. There wasn't much that he thought he'd ever keep from his little man, but it was good to know how to do it, just in case. How did you get to be so smart? He teased his lover, and watched with delight as Michael blushed prettily. I studied how to be an alpha mate for dummies, Michael responded, and Hal threw his head back and laughed loudly. His mate was absolutely delightful. He was definitely a keeper. Speaking of studying, how about you reteach me sign language? They'd been in that diner for four hours. They'd done nothing but catch up and learn about each other. He and Katharina had taught Hal as much sign language as they could. They were surprised at how quickly he'd picked it up and how much he'd remembered. It seemed as if that sense memory thing was actually a real thing. Michael had learned a lot about his mate in those four hours. He'd learned how stubborn he could be. He'd been told by Janessa that they couldn't just sit around in the diner if they weren't eating or drinking something ordered from the kitchen, so Hal kept ordering coffee and slices of pie, only leaving the table to go to the restroom and coming back out to resume their lessons. About halfway through their lesson, Michael had gotten downright uncomfortable in the brown t-shirt that he'd thrown on in their haste to leave Vegas, and had gone out to change into a v-neck shirt. He'd noticed, when he returned, how often Hal kept looking at him. It went a long way towards making him feel sexy, at least to his mate. Michael found himself relaxing for the first time in a long time the longer that they sat there, allowing his left leg to press against Hal's right one underneath the table. After a while, he'd slowly wrapped his left foot around Hal's right, spreading the big Texan's legs apart. He nodded as his sister explained to Hal how to ask a question in sign language and dropped his left hand underneath the table very casually. He slowly slid his hand over to Hal's thigh and rested it there for a moment. He felt the muscles in Hal's thigh tighten beneath the fabric of the jeans and felt a thrill race down his spine. He swallowed deeply, trying to calm his racing heart as he subtly drifted his hand up towards Hal's crotch. He could feel the heat radiating from his mate's groin, could feel the hard ridge pressing against his fingers from behind the denim. His ass clenched in response. His cock lengthened and thickened in his own jeans, and he inhaled deeply the scent of his arousal mixing with howls and washing over his senses. He couldn't believe that he was doing this, feeling up his mate in public. There was something about being with Howl, though. It made the wanton, overly confident side of him that he'd only caught glimpses of want to come out to play. Feeling his cheeks burn in embarrassment when Katharina looked at him with a raised eyebrow, 
He went to move his hand back to the table, only to have Hal grab his hand and prevent it from moving. He cast a glance up at his mate through his hair, his heart pounding, his question catching in his throat at the smoldering glance thrown his way from Hal. He saw the Texan's lips move as he said something, but wasn't able to follow or understand exactly what he was saying. How is it possible that his mate's lips always looked so fucking kissable? Almost like they were filled with the sweetest juices. Michael found himself leaning towards the bigger man, intent on biting his lip and sucking to see if he could get all of the juices out, when he was startled out of his reverie by a sharp pain in his right arm. He swung around to glare at his sister as she sat back with a pleased smirk on her face when he remembered where he was. He was in fucking Flagstaff. What did they even think of gays? Of interracial couples? Of transgenders? He could be setting them all up for a massive brawl. He had to pull himself together. He could wait and not attack his mate before they had a chance to get to a hotel for the night. Yeah, he totally could. With a determined grunt, Michael sat back in his seat and began to recite every state and capital. When he got through the list, if he was still rock-hard horny, then he'd just move on to the periodic table. He'd do whatever he had to do to keep himself from ripping his mate's clothes from his body. It's going to be a long day. Chapter 9 So is it fun to be a cowboy? Michael asked, his hands moving in an almost smooth rhythm. Hal pulled his eyes away from Michael's cleavage when he noticed the other man's hands moving and focused on the man in front of him. He was proud of himself for being able to understand what the other man had just signed to him. It was starting to get dark outside, and they had been informed that the diner was going to be closing soon. They knew that they'd have to get up and leave in at least an hour or so, but they were enjoying themselves way too much. Learning about Michael was definitely one of Hal's newest favorite pastimes. What was the question again? Hal inquired, his hands moving slow and with no grace at all. He started clenching his teeth in that moment, in order to stop him from reaching across the table and pulling Michael into his lap. The smaller man had gotten up and moved across from him when he'd been unable to keep his hands to himself. Could Michael really blame him, though? There was a persistent fire that was burning underneath his skin, and it was driving him to distraction. Michael smirked and shifted on the seat before asking the question again. I asked if it was fun to be a cowboy, he asked again, this time his hands moving slower, as if that was the reason that Hal hadn't first understood the question. Hal almost groaned in frustration when the smaller man folded his arms across his chest. His gorgeous chest. Hal didn't fully understand why Michael hadn't gone and gotten both surgeries done, or why he still referred to himself as Michael and as he. Hal knew other transgenders, and they were all very emphatic about being called the correct pronoun. Michael didn't seem to be fazed by it, or maybe he was just really good at pretending. He had told Hal that getting the bottom surgery was just more money than he was willing to spend, and that he felt like a woman now. Or rather, he felt like he was supposed to feel like he was finally in the right body. And it was a beautiful body. Noticing that Michael was laughing, he looked around to see what was so funny before returning his attention back to his mate. What's so funny? He asked with a grin, his fingers moving very quickly through the signs for the sentence. He was very proud of himself for that one sentence and turned to grin broadly at Katharina, who sat at the next table with Janessa helping the elf to fill ketchup bottles. You? I bet you forgot the question again, didn't you? Michael asked with a chuckle, his hands moving quicker as he signed the question this time. Hal was aware that Michael was signing faster and faster as he got more and more comfortable with the motions, but it still didn't help when he was still so easily distracted with his mate's mouth-watering body. Hal groaned and slapped a hand to his forehead, loving the sound of Michael's giggle. Who knew that a man into his thirties could make a noise like a teenage girl? Lifting his head, Hal looked at Michael again and, raising his hand, signed, what was the question again? This time he made sure that he paid attention to what Michael asked him in order to answer the question this time. He nodded to let Michael know that he'd caught the question this time and thought seriously about what he was being asked before he attempted to answer. I don't know if I would say it was fun, he signed slowly. It is challenging. He signed out the last word, letter by letter, and watched as Michael showed him the sign for challenge before he continued. 
I enjoy working with animals, being a part of a pack, working on a ranch. I don't really like riding horses, though. He watched as Michael tilted his head to the side as he thought about what Howell had said. Howell could hear the thoughts swirling in his mate's mind, and could finally understand why the other man had suggested that he learn how to sign in addition to their mating link. Wow, Michael could think a lot of things at once. That was kind of intimidating. Why don't you like riding horses? Michael finally asked him. Lack of control? Hal responded, prepared to answer the question as soon as it fully formed in Michael's mind. He watched as Michael nodded, pleased that his mate understood why that would be such an issue for him, and then mentally girded his loins in order to ask the question that he'd been avoiding for hours. Do you know what happened to Noel and Latroy? He tried not to whine with sadness when Michael's face was leached completely of all color. He could tell from that reaction alone that his mate knew exactly what had happened to his sister and cousin. We got word that they were found and killed, Michael answered him. Howell's eyes slid closed and his hands clenched into fists on the table. His wolf began battering at his soul, desperate to get free. He needed to run, he needed to howl, and he needed to rip someone apart. He could feel his body shaking with the urge to not shift, and he shoved out of the booth without another word to Michael. He turned towards the door to the diner. He needed to get out of the building. The smells of grease, meat, humans, other paranormals, fear, grief, shame, anger, and even lust clogged his nostrils, making it difficult for him to breathe. His lungs locked in his chest. The edges of his vision blurred, and he could feel himself losing the fight with his wolf against the shift. He raced towards the door and shoved open the door, gulping in a lungful of the clean night air. He coughed when the smell of gas and engine fuel permeated his senses. He was still too close to humans, to civilization, to other people. They weren't even the right people. They weren't the people that he needed to be around at that point. He needed to be around Noel and Latroy, but they were dead. Dead. How was that even possible? How was it possible that he'd lost his father, sister, and cousin so close together? His skin stretched tight across his body, to the point of causing him physical pain as he felt his wolf shoving to get free. Tossing back his head, he let loose a loud howl of grief and ripped off his clothes and boots. He allowed the shift to finally flow over his body and then ran for the woods that surrounded the diner. He had no destination in mind and thought of nothing else but outrunning the cries of the dead that followed him. Chapter 10 Michael ran out of the diner after Howell and saw the moment that his mate shifted into his wolf form and ran for the forest. Guilt, anger, and shame clawed at his insides, and he wondered if what he was feeling was his own emotions or those of his almost feral mate. He could sense Katharina and Janessa walking up behind him, and another person, a man who smelled faintly of Janessa as well. Turning around, he almost swallowed his tongue at the sight of the gorgeous tall man who stood with his arm wrapped around Janessa's slender shoulders. This is Prince Draco Lightenson. He's Janessa's songkeeper, Jenny's mate, Katharina signed to him. He bowed to the other man out of respect and then turned back to the areas where he'd seen Howell disappear. He knew that what he'd just done could be seen as a slight against the elfin prince, but in that moment he didn't really care. He was worried about his mate. He was especially concerned because of the disjointed thoughts and images that flashed through his mind, and the fact that he couldn't speak to it. He wished that he knew where Hal was, and if he were coming back. Well, he was pretty sure that he was coming back. Hal wouldn't just leave him behind. Granted, they hadn't been mated that long, but he knew his mate. He knew his man's character. Hal was a man of integrity, and no matter how hurt and angry he was, he wouldn't abandon his mate at a roadside diner. Besides, his truck was still there. Michael just really wished that he knew where he was and if he was really okay. No matter how short of a time he'd been gone, they couldn't be sure that Michael and Katharina's father hadn't tracked them to the diner and wasn't waiting, even at that moment, to take them all out, one by one. I can tell you where your mate is, if you would like me to, little one. Michael heard the voice in his mind and opened his mouth in shock as he turned to face Prince Draco. Can you hear me? He questioned the elf and took a step back in fear when the other man merely nodded and smiled. How is that possible? You are not an alpha nor my mate. How are you able to talk to me? 
I am a prince, an elf prince. My realm is full of magic. We exude magic with every step we take, and it is the same for our distant fairy cousins. I can hear your thoughts and those of your mates. Indeed, I can hear the thoughts of anyone that I choose. I can also tell you where your mate is, if you wouldn't mind me touching the mating mark on your neck. Prince Draco offered, taking a step towards Michael. Michael took a step back instantly. The mating mark was a sacred thing among wolf shifters. If he let this man, this stranger, touch his mating mark, then his scent would be on his skin when Howl returned. That would pretty much ensure that Howl would attempt to rip the prince limb from limb. With the prince having magic, would he kill Howl in defense of himself? I will do nothing to hurt your mate, little one, but you seem very distressed by his departure, and I only seek to help you find him. Prince Draco reassured him. Aware that he was very concerned about his mate, Michael nodded his head and turned his head away from the mate, bearing his mating mark to the prince. No sooner had he done that than he could smell his mate. Turning quickly to his left, he was stunned by the sight of his mate in his wolf form. His mate was a gorgeous and very large white wolf, his fur coat almost the exact same color as the sands on the beach of Barbados. Michael didn't have time to continue to admire the beauty of his mate in wolf form, however. He became aware of the fact that his mate was staring at Prince Draco with his upper lip pulled back in a snarl. He then realized that the prince was standing very close to him, with his hand up near Michael's neck. Oh, shit. How? he called out to his mate through their mating link. When he received no response from his mate, he stepped away from the prince and walked slowly towards his mate. For once he welcomed the silence of his deafness. He knew that his sister was no doubt yelling at him, forgetting that he couldn't hear her. He was aware of the prince trying to get his attention through his mind, but he threw up a wall to cut out anyone except his mate. He had to get Howell to calm down. He had to bring his mate back to him. Howell, baby, it's me, Michael, your mate. He could see his mate's fur vibrating and knew that regardless of his reassurances, the other man had not heard him. Grabbing the hem of his shirt, he pulled it off and then slowly pulled off his shoes and pants. He was absurdly glad that his breasts weren't large enough to really need a large bra at this point, since he'd chosen not to wear one. Pulling off his briefs, he closed his eyes and felt his skin ripple as he allowed his shift to wash over him. Once the shift was complete, he opened his eyes and saw Howl standing directly in front of him, his teeth bared. Without hesitation, he rolled over to his back to expose his stomach to the more dominant wolf. He whined softly as he felt the press of Hal's muzzle against his neck, seconds before he felt the pierce of his mate's canines in his mating mark again. His body shook as he felt himself shifting back to his human form, Hal removing his teeth in time before the shift completely started. Wolf shifters returned to their human forms after having an orgasm, and Michael was, of course, no exception. When he opened his eyes this time, he felt himself being blanketed by over six feet and two hundred pounds of gorgeous man-flesh. Mine, he heard Howl growl in their mating link. He exhaled happily and wrapped his arms and legs around his mate, happy that grief and anger hadn't kept his mate feral. He knew that the situation with his father was far from being over, but for the moment he was extremely happy to have his mate in his arms. His mate was apparently just as happy. Michael wiggled against the hard ridge pressing against his stomach and felt his previously satisfied cock growing hard with renewed energy. He knew that Howell said something to those who still stood outside looking at them. He could feel rumbling of the other man's chest against his face, but at that moment he didn't care. He lifted his head and licked a line up his mate's torso to his collarbone. Closing his lips on the beautiful brown skin, he sucked it into his mouth deeply and scraped one canine down the swollen skin. The lower half of his body pressed up and undulated against his mate's pelvis as he chased after that desired physical relief. He pressed his body closer to Howl when he felt the man pressing up against the ground in order to stand. He scrambled to hold on, the hard ridges of his lover's abs rubbing deliciously against his cock, providing a deliciously wicked feeling of stimulation against his engorged shaft. His back arched as Howl held him close to his body as he walked them quickly over to the truck pressing his finger against Michael's clenching asshole. Michael exhaled shakily, the air in his lungs returning and escaping in quick bursts of air as his arousal and his need for his mate rose to higher heights. He grabbed the thick ropes of his mate's hair and pulled them roughly, grinning wolfishly when he felt his back slammed against the side of the truck. He leaned forward and crushed his lips down onto Howell's. He needed a taste of his man in that moment. 
He had to fill his mouth with the unique flavor of his mate, and he had to do it now. When Howell sat him down on the passenger seat of the truck, he quickly turned and lay down with his head hanging down towards the bottom of the truck. He was uncaring of the feel of the truck's leather seat against his skin. He didn't care about the bugs that flew around his flushed and aroused body. All he cared about in that moment was getting his mate's cock in his mouth. Reaching out, he gripped his mate's large, hard dick and brought it towards his open mouth. At the first touch of the smooth as silk over a hardened steel shaft on his tongue, Michael's hips thrust upwards in pleasure. His eyes closed as he savored the slightly bitter taste of his mate's precum sliding over his taste buds. He felt as Howell surged forward and then pulled back slowly and relaxed the muscles of his throat as he felt the head of his lover's cock enter the tight passage of his esophagus. He put his hands up and around Howell's legs, grabbing his ass and pulling him closer. He wanted him to fuck his mouth. Please, Howell, please fuck my mouth, he pleaded. He was extremely happy when he felt Hal slowly begin fucking his mouth and throat. As Hal pressed his dick deeper and deeper, Michael swallowed around the head of his mate's thick cock and gloried in the quivering of the larger man's limbs. When Hal pulled his cock out of Michael's mouth with a pop, he scrambled up to his knees, prepared to beg Hal for more, when the black man grabbed his breasts in his large hands and squeezed them in his unrelenting grasp. His head dropped back as pleasure sprinted through his body. His cock was leaking copious amounts of precum by the time Hal began flicking his hardened nipples with his tongue and scraping his canines over them. Gods, Hal, I am so past needing foreplay right now. Just fuck me already. He heard Hal's chuckle in his mind and felt his chest expand on the squeal he no doubt released when Hal flipped him over onto his hands and knees. He didn't even have time to reprimand the other man before he was gasping at the feel of Howell's tongue pressing deep inside of his ass alongside the finger that he slowly pressed in. He grit his teeth in an effort to hold back the pleasure that threatened to drown him, and pressed his ass back towards his large mate. He forced himself to relax when he felt Howell pressing another finger in his ass. His passage stretched to accommodate Howell as the cowboy pressed two more fingers into Michael's tight channel. His arm shook as he fought tooth and nail to hold back his orgasm, digging his fingers into the seat underneath him, biting his lower lip so hard the coppery taste of his blood filled his mouth. He didn't care what he had to do, but he absolutely refused to come until Howell was inside of him. Finally, finally, he felt the press of Howell's supernatural snake pressing into his ass. He felt Howell freeze as he pushed the head of his cock into Michael's ass, and then he heard the other man's laughter in his mind. What the fuck is so funny, and why are you thinking about it when you should be fucking me? He asked grumpily, putting forth an image of him pouting to his mate's mind. Supernatural snake? Hal questioned him with another mental snicker before he shoved his cock and balls deep into Michael's ass. His inner muscles clutched onto the intruding members as if they never wanted the oversized cock to leave them, and Michael could certainly understand. His body trembled as he felt Hal withdraw from his ass. Oh, gods, out! was good. Out was so very, very good. He scrambled to hold himself up as Hal slammed back into his puckered entrance and revised his earlier statement. Oh, Christ! In was delicious. In was so wonderfully delicious. He waffled between which was better, in or out, as Hal rammed his cock in and out of his body until he couldn't think at all. Howell's thrusts sped up, and Michael balanced himself on his left elbow as he dropped his right hand to his red, almost purple, and leaking cock and barely stroked it before he felt the tingle at the base of his spine spread up and down his body like wildfire. And his orgasm exploded within him a full minute before he felt his seed shoot from the slit of his cock. He fell forward with a long and deep exhale of sheer pleasure, his body now nothing more than a wet noodle his ass still a tight, gripping vice of pleasure for his mate's extreme enjoyment. He was barely aware of Hal's continued rampage in his puckered hole. He was so blissed out. The minute that Hal stiffened and he felt the copious amounts of his mate's hot, white sperm flood his channel, some of it overflowing it and dripping on his balls and the seat below him, he gripped the edges of the seat as another, smaller orgasm swept over his body. Howell collapsed over on top of him, and he couldn't even work up the energy to complain. He was beyond satisfied. He was worlds away from sexual release and gratification. He'd been beyond heaven's pearly gates with that orgasm. 
had in fact seen God, Buddha, Krishna, the goddess, and every other deity that he'd ever heard of, and thanked them all for creating Howl, just the way that they did, and as he returned to earth, back to reality, on a purple cloud of hazy, musky, gratifying man sex, he was astonished to once again hear his mate's chuckle in his mind. Seriously, Mikey? Supernatural snake? Chapter 11 Hal sighed with relief as he looked up at the large house before him. He was home. Well, he was at the place that had represented home for him for the past ten years. It was so good to be back at the Tate Ranch, even if they were only there for a few days, just long enough to rest up before they headed towards Georgia. He hated to delay, but he also knew that Richard would be worrying about him, and more than that, Vet was probably beyond pissed at him for leaving without talking to him first. The smell of nervousness was almost choking him, and he turned to reassure Michael when he realized that the nervousness was coming from Katharina. He quirked an eyebrow at her in confusion, and opened his mouth to ask her what was wrong when he caught the distinct smell of horses and wood. Ton. No wonder Katharina had been so nervous. There were very few people in the world who were bigger than Howell. Ton and Vet just happened to be two of them. Hmm, apparently it's an alpha thing to be oversized he wondered to himself. I wonder if he's dragging around an anaconda in his pants like you are, Michael asked, an innocent smile on his face when Howell turned to glare at him. The sight of the petite man's smile caused his own lips to twitch as he fought to not give in to the urge to grin. His mate was a brat, a gorgeous, sexy, irresistible brat. He puckered up his lips at the smaller man and then turned back to face Tun. Anton Tun Forrester was one of his oldest friends, and now that he was mated himself, he could certainly understand Tun's reaction when Tommy left him. He was pretty sure that if Michael said he couldn't handle being mated to him, he would bitch and moan for a few hours, and then he would take off after him and drag him back. It was just how he was. <sighs> Michael scoffed. Like I'd ever be stupid enough to leave you, he heard Michael say seconds before the door closed. He climbed from the truck and slammed his own door closed, before shoving his hands in the pockets of his jeans. He knew that he and Tun needed to make amends and apologize, but damn if he knew what he was apologizing for. For being insensitive, Michael offered, and Hal threw his mate a grateful glance before looking back at his old friend. His palms were sweaty and his mouth was dry. He hated apologizing, so he had a rule to either never do anything that would require him apologizing to someone else, or just never apologize. He often got stuck doing a lot of the first thing because options two and three never worked out for him all that much. So, look, man, you know what I said about Tommy, he said, allowing his words to trail off, knowing that Tun would understand what he was trying to say. Yeah, man, I got you. And what I said about you and your hair, you know that I... Tun began and Hal cut him off. Yeah, man, I know, he promised his friend. So, we cool? Tun asked him, checking to make sure that all was really well between them. Yeah, man, we cool, Howell assured him, the two cowboys bumping fists and grinning like schoolboys at each other. Remembering Michael and Katharina, Howell called them both over with a wave of his hand. So, looks like you're not the only one who's got a mate. I found mine out in Las Vegas. Pat kicked him out and disowned him after beating him up when he came out to them as gay and transgender. Howell explained to Tun, knowing that if he explained everything to Tun now, the older man would explain it all to Vet later, thereby saving Howell a little bit of trouble. Oh, God's damn it. Shit, for real? Tun asked, and Howell merely nodded. He watched as Tun looked at Michael and then back at him. So, he was a female, and now he's a man, or... Hal hesitated to answer. He probably should have checked with Michael first before he started spouting off his personal information. He'd just been extremely excited to show off his mate, and he'd wanted to get all of the preliminary information out of the way ahead of time. Shit, looked like he'd fucked up. Again. One day he was going to manage to go the whole day without fucking up things that dealt with his mate, he promised himself. Hey, baby, is it all right if I tell a ton about you? You know, the whole transgender thing. He questioned his smaller mate. He could sense Michael's hesitation and fear through their link and knew that he was worried that Tun would react the same way that Michael's father and his pack had reacted. Howell knew that Tun wouldn't react that way, but Michael didn't, and so it was up to him to reassure the man. 
John is Anton Forrester. He's the beta of the Tate Pack. His mate is Tommy Wilkins, who is a cross-dresser. He wears women's clothes and performs on stage in New York. Well, at least he used to perform on stage back in New York. Our pack alpha is Vernon Tate, but we all call him Vet. His mate is Richard Tilson, who used to be a very successful dancer. The two of them are raising Vet's sister's triplets since she passed away recently. He could sense Michael's fear easing and his hesitation fading away. He breathed a sigh of relief. He was glad that he'd made the right call there. Really glad. He wanted everyone to get along, but more than that, he wanted his mate to feel comfortable. Michael's comfort and safety were his main priority. Yeah, you can tell him, Michael reassured him, and turning towards Tun, Howell proceeded to tell his best friend everything that he knew about Michael, his sister Katharina, his father Alfred, and the Prasachi pack back in Georgia. They walked towards the main house as they talked. Michael's hand gripped firmly in his own, and he struggled to keep his mind focused on what he was saying, and not on the image of his cock buried in his mate's ass, or the thought of Michael on his knees begging him for more of his cock. He was abruptly pulled out of his fantasies by the impact of Richard launching himself into his arms and welcoming him home. He moved to wrap his arms around his best friend when he heard Michael growling possessively. It wasn't a sound that he'd ever heard before, but judging from the way his cock was growing hard, it was a sound that he found very arousing. He gently pushed Richard away from him and pulled Michael into his arms, wrapping his arms around his mate and pressing the other man's face into his neck. He shivered as he felt Michael snuffling and pressing his nose into the crease of his neck, licking and growling as he pressed closer, trying to rid Howell's body of Richard's scent and replace it with his own. He could feel his cock growing impossibly thick the organ trying to burst through his jeans and get into Michael's ass. They obviously couldn't do anything right now, not with Vet, Richard, Dunn, and Katharina all standing there watching them, but he promised himself that as soon as he got the opportunity he was going to whisk Michael away to his cabin on Packlands, and he was going to fuck him so hard that the other man wouldn't be able to sit down for a week. As Michael pressed his equally hard cock against the front of his thigh, Howell growled low in his throat, lowering his head to lick the side of Michael's throat the sound of the younger man's heartbeat, calming his racing heart. If you're done molesting your mate, perhaps you can introduce him to the rest of us? That said from somewhere in front of him, and Howell lifted his head to grin sheepishly at his alpha. Everyone, this is Michael Versace, my mate. Michael was completely overwhelmed. He and Katharina had been introduced to the alpha, his mate, and their children. He and Howell had then been asked to take a walk with Vet, where the Alpha admitted to Michael, through Howell, that he didn't know sign language, and that he thought it would be good for him to learn, not just him, but all of the pack members. Vet had then turned to him and asked for him to teach a few ASL classes. Michael had been confused and shocked that the Alpha had requested such a thing from him. He'd stammered out a yes and then turned to Howell in amazement. His cowboy had merely smiled at him and signed that he would be able to do a few classes before they'd be leaving for Georgia, and then he'd be able to pick them back up when they got back. He hadn't realized how much he loved teaching until that moment, and he was actually really excited about teaching the other pack members all that he knew. For now, however, he was on pins and needles as he and Howell walked towards Ton and Tommy's cabin to have dinner. Howell had shown him his own place, which was actually pretty large for him to have been the only one sleeping there. Howell had grinned and shrugged sheepishly when he'd admitted that he'd always felt, in the back of his mind, where he'd shoved it years ago, that he would have a family of his own one day. His cabin was one story, but there were four main bedrooms, a guest room which also doubled as an office, a kitchen, dining room, and a family room that seemed massively huge by Michael's standards, until he saw that it was that big to house Howell's extremely large flat-screen television. He'd laughed at his mate when Hal explained that it was for watching the Super Bowl the way it was meant to be seen, and had just continued back to their bedroom. Their master suite was a thing of beauty. It was large and surrounded by windows on three sides. A king-sized four-poster bed sat in the middle of the room. There was no television in the room, but Michael did notice that there was a stereo and two large dressers. Besides those things, there was nothing else. There were no bookshelves, no pictures, no knickknacks. Michael felt sadness wash over him for his mate. He wondered how many people from his pack knew exactly how lonely he was. He looked over at his mate and saw that deep-seated sadness that reflected in his eyes, and without thought he dropped his bags to the ground and grabbed Hal's arm to drag him off to the bed. 
He'd been rather forceful with the big cowboy, but Hal seemed to be extremely turned on by that fact. They'd both had explosive orgasms, and now, even hours later, he was still slightly weak and shaky from the force of it. Hal had spent the hours that they'd been there on the phone with everyone that he knew and still kept in contact with back in Georgia. Katharina had shut herself up in her room for a few hours and had left, signing to him that she'd see him at dinner. He didn't know what was going on with her, but she'd been hyper-reserved since arriving on the Tate Ranch. He hoped that whatever was bothering her would go away soon. He didn't like his sister the way she was currently behaving, as if she were looking for someone or avoiding someone. It was all very confusing and distressing to him. He'd been online, checking his email on the laptop that Hal had given him for him to use, and after he'd replied to his former job, explaining why he'd been forced to leave without notice, he'd begun a search. He wouldn't tell Hal, but he was pretty sure that he knew where Noel's children, Mariah and Cody, were being held. It was Latroy's two children that he couldn't find. He didn't know their names, there were no records of them having ever been born, although he was pretty sure that they existed. So he'd spent hours trying to find out whatever information that he could find about them and Latroy. He hadn't talked to Hal about it, of course, but he knew his mate, and he knew himself. Those children didn't need to be in the foster homes and orphanages that they'd been forced to live in. They belonged with their family, and he'd do whatever he had to do to bring those children home with them. Hours of searching, and he'd come up with nothing. Their trip to Georgia had taken on a whole new meaning for him. He wasn't just going to be heading there to warn the Marshall family that his father had snapped again. He was going to be going to put a stop to the man, once and for all, and he was going to find Latroy's children. He owed it to his friend. As he looked up at Howell, who stood beside him in front of Tun and Tommy's cabin, he knew that he didn't just owe it to Latroy. He owed it to his mate as well. He smiled up at Howell when the man looked down at him and pressed himself fully along the other man's side just as the door opened. He smiled widely at the woman who opened the door and quirked his eyebrow when the smell of his sister wafted off of the woman's skin towards him. Well, that's interesting, Howell mused, and he agreed. Was that why Katharina had been so on edge? Was this woman her mate? He knew that he could pester her about it all later, and stuck out his hand to shake the stranger's hand. She says that her name is Lucy. She's Tun's sister and a friend of your sister's, which means either they're mates or they're new fuck buddies because she smells just like cat, Al told him. Michael snickered and signed the letters of his name to Lucy slowly, pointing first at himself and then stretching and bending his fingers to form the letters of his name. M-I-C-H-A-E-L. He watched as Howell did the same and watched as Lucy turned to him and flawlessly spelled her own name. Makes me feel like an idiot. She picked it up so fast. Howell stated with an obvious pout in his voice through their link. Michael just shook his head at the other man and followed Lucy in the door, mentally girding his loins for anything. You remember Howell, right? Don asked Tommy, and Howell smiled when the smaller man smiled and nodded at him. He nodded his head back and greeting before reaching underneath the table to rub Michael's stomach where he sat on his lap, which of course caused his smaller man to giggle. He'd only found out a few hours before how extremely ticklish his mate was, and he had no shame in exploiting that knowledge right at that moment. He knew that Michael was still very tense about meeting the pack, and really, this was the only way he could think of to get the other man to loosen up. If it caused everyone else to smile at them and think that they were such a cute couple, then that was just an added bonus. The giggly little man on his lap is Michael. He's one of the wolves that just recently joined the pack because his pack kicked him out for not only being gay and deaf, but he's transgender. Male to female, he just didn't get the full procedure done. Don stated with no hesitation, and when Tommy gasped, Howell tried not to laugh. Tommy obviously had not known how extremely nonchalant the big Texan could be when it came to divulging the life story of this complete stranger especially when it came down to a subject that he didn't find particularly taboo, before that moment. It had taken Howell a few weeks to get used to Tun's particular brand of speech, but he was extremely grateful for his friend's bluntness now. One never had to question where they stood with Tun. They always knew. It was refreshing. I am Michael, and I approve Tun's way of speaking, Michael teased him through their link, and Howell pressed his face against his mate's neck in order to stop himself from laughing out loud. Michael had started saying that silly catchphrase since they'd gotten back in the truck to head from Arizona to Texas. 
No one knew why Hal would burst into what seemed to them to be spontaneous laughter, but they didn't know how extremely refreshing his mate could be for his usually very serious nature. Don't worry, baby, he told me I could tell you, Tun reassured Tommy, and Hal smiled at the other man when he turned to silently question him. Tommy nodded and greeted Michael shyly, merely waving his hand, which Michael returned just as shyly. Howell knew that their shyness with each other would only last for a moment. It wouldn't be long before the two of them would be best buds, and would be causing havoc with Alex and Richard. He'd bet his favorite pair of boots on that. And sitting next to Lucy is Michael's sister, Katharina. Tun finished the introductions, and Howell watched his cat beamed brilliantly at Tommy. She had certainly done a complete 180-degree turn from the depressed shell of a woman she'd been previously. He was certainly very happy for that, but he couldn't fight the curiosity that filled his mind at what exactly had happened between the last time that he'd seen her and now. "'It's very nice to meet all of you,' Tommy said with a happy smile, and sat in the chair that Tun held out for him. Howell was happy that the other man had finally showed up and sat down. He was starving, and he'd heard some very good things about Tommy's cooking. He knew that at some point he would have to go and get to know the other man that he had looked down on previously, but at that moment he was more than content to get to know his cooking. "'Well, let's eat,' Tun stated in a booming voice that caused everyone at the table, except Michael, to jump. "'Damn, Tun, if Mikey wasn't already deaf, you yelling that loudly would have made him that way,' Hal teased, and everyone laughed with him, before they began passing around the food and filling up their plates." Howell smiled internally as he felt his soul breathe a sigh of relief. Right or wrong, this was what he needed. A little time spent with his pack, his new family, before he went to face the demons of his past. Michael would teach a sign language class the next day, which Howell was determined to go sit in on in order to learn more than what he already knew. And as soon as the class was over, they would be heading to Georgia. He glanced over at Katharina, sitting next to Lucy, the two women speaking in hushed tones and touching often, and wondered if she would still be traveling with them. He hoped so. They needed all the help that they could get. Chapter 12 It was a full two weeks before they left for Georgia. Two whole fucking weeks. They had to deal with Tommy's psychotic ex showing up at the Tate Ranch, First Tommy, Tun, and Christine, the horse, had all been shot. Tommy was paralyzed from the waist down, though he wasn't letting that stop him from still being fabulous. He just made Tun dress him now. Michael shook his head, with a fond smile stretching his lips as he thought of the last glimpse he'd had of Tommy. The small, beautiful man had been wearing a sundress that was white with yellow flowers all on it, with yellow high heels. His hair had been blowing in the wind, and Tun had been holding him in his arms against his chest. Michael found Tommy completely fascinating and was glad that he'd taken the chance to talk to him and get to know him better. They had discussed the difference between cross-dressers, transgenders, drag queens, drag kings, and people who were gender fluid, which was what Michael had realized that he was through their conversations. He resisted the labels of male or female. He was proud to essentially encompass both. He grinned when Howell took his hand and his own from where he sat next to him in the truck. His mate apparently approved as well. Yes, everything would be perfect for them right now if it wasn't for one major thorn in their sides. Michael's father. They had received word back from one of Howell's contacts back in Georgia that Alfred Frasacci had declared war on the Marshall Pack and that Howell's grandmother, Mary, was the one leading the pack at the moment. Michael had never seen a look of anger like the one he'd seen cross his mate's face at that moment. Had his father not been the pure embodiment of Satan, he might have felt pity for him. Too bad his father was the devil. He turned to look back at Lucy and Katharina hesitantly when he felt a knee press into the back of his chair. He could only hope that they weren't making out again. He was happy that his sister had found one of her mates. The other one, a man, someone from Lucy's past, and someone that she'd informed Katharina that they would have to live without. However, they made out more than he and Hal did, which was definitely saying something. His thoughts cut off as they pulled up in front of the gates of Marshall Plantation. Memories rushed through his mind. Pictures of he and Hal playing together as children, watching Hal play with Noel, Latroy, and Latanya with Katharina, and wishing that they had a family like theirs. His heart clenched in his chest, and his throat clogged with unshed tears. 
When he'd left Prasache House, he'd made a promise to himself that he would never return to Georgia, and he definitely would be close enough to the Prasache pack that he'd have to worry for his safety. This whole situation sucked. Big, huge, hairy monkey balls. And not in a good way, either. Now that was just a disgusting image. Hal teased him in an effort to soothe him, and he gave his mate a small smile. He felt selfish and ashamed. He should be comforting and supporting Hal. Instead, he was the one sitting in the truck shaking like a leaf. Hal was the one who had lost four members of his family. Hal was the one who was essentially rising from the dead in the eyes of his birth pack. Hal, who had four children from his family missing, was comforting him. He had to shake the fear and melancholy off of himself, or he was going to be of no use to his mate at all. You being inside me is a huge help to me, baby. Trust me. Hal reassured him, squeezing his fingers lightly. Michael swallowed thickly, the large knot of tension that had lodged itself in his throat slowly sinking down to rest in his stomach. He watched as Hal pressed the gate code, and when the gate swung open, he could feel Hal's frustration drifting through their link. He wondered at that moment how Hal knew the code for the gate when he hadn't been on the grounds in over two decades. They haven't changed the code since I left. If your father or any of his other bigoted racist cronies knew the code, they could have come and attacked the entire pack by now, Hal informed him, and Michael shared his mate's frustration at that point. While their hometown was a lot safer than other cities in the country, the fact of the matter was the marshals weren't safe from the Prasaches, so them leaving the gate code the same as it had been two decades ago was beyond irresponsible. It was just plain stupid. Michael opened his mouth to suggest to Hal that perhaps they should get someone to change the code when his eyes took in the beauty of the Marshall Plantation Packlands. He and Katharina had always thought that the Marshall Pack was full of kings and queens. Their property was full of lush green trees and flowers. They were constantly in awe of the extremely beautiful homes and gazebos that covered the land. Those things hadn't changed at all. The land was still beautiful. However, it seemed as if the life of the Pack the air surrounding the grounds was heavy and fraught with tension, grief, despair, and rage. It made Michael shiver as if icy fingers had traced a line up his spine. Something was coming. Something was about to happen, and it was going to be big, and it was going to be bad. And they were going to be right in the middle of it all. Hal choked back the tears that threatened to spill from his eyes and wrapped a mental chokehold around the grief that tried to overwhelm his senses. He had to stay strong. He couldn't give in to the emotions that threatened to drag him under. He had to be brave and bold for his mate, his pack, his grandmother. His sweet grandmother, who was always happy and always saw the good in people. His grandmother, who was walking towards the truck smoking a joint? What the fuck? Hal threw open the driver's door and hopped out quickly, ignoring the pain in his foot as he stormed towards his grandmother. Grandma Mary, are you seriously getting high? At your age? Seriously? You need to put that out. As a matter of fact, you need to give me the joint right now, he ordered her, holding out his hand. He heard the gasps and the cries of surprise and shock that sounded from the pack members who had gathered around them, but ignored them all. He couldn't deal with them at the moment. He had to deal with his sweet grandmother, the drug addict. Boy, this is peyote. You know, peyote that them Indians be smoking all the time. I had a few of my friends come over, and we went on a spirit walk out in the fields. It was very enlightening. I saw my son, your daddy, and he told me that you was coming home and bringing your mate with you, his grandmother said, her words starting to slur and slow down as the drugs began to take effect. He watched as she looked over his shoulder at Michael, Katharina, and Lucy, before she nodded and looked back at him. His grandmother Mary stood a whopping five feet four inches when she stood up to her full height, but she spent a lot of time hunched over, that she appeared even smaller than she actually was. It was a pure manipulative move. People didn't think she was as dangerous as she actually was because of her height and diminutive frame, but when she shifted into her wolf form, they were always shocked and afraid. Her wolf form was almost the exact same as Howell's wolf, and even more vicious. Howell wouldn't admit it, even under threat of torture, that his grandmother scared him sometimes. She would easily smile at someone one minute, and then stab them in the heart the next, still with that sweet smile on her face. I always knew that the Prosace boy was your mate, she shocked him by saying. 
Hal had thought he was going to have to explain to her that he was gay and Michael was his mate, but it seemed as though she'd already figured it out. He merely nodded at her, feeling like a little boy all over again, as he shuffled his feet and looked down at the scuffed toes of his boots. "'Well, stop lollygagging, boy, and introduce me to the boy. I remember that he was deaf, but I don't remember him being so damn pretty. Although I do seem to recall a bunch of foolishness going on over on the Prasache land when he came out to them. It's stupid if you ask me. Don't people know that love don't care about gender or race?' It's a bunch of scared bisexuals in this world, his grandmother said to him before taking another hit of the peyote. Hal shook his head before taking the joint out of her hand, turning to face the members of his pack who all stared at him like he was a ghost or the messiah, which he guessed to them he was both. He gestured for Michael to come and stand next to him on one side, his grandmother on the other side. I am sure that you are all surprised that I am standing before you alive and made it. So, allow me to explain. When Latanya was kidnapped and murdered, my parents and aunt and uncle decided to send Noel, Latroy, and myself off to be adopted in an effort to keep us safe from the person who had threatened to kill us. He began explaining. Alfred Prasacci! a man yelled from the back of the group. Howell raised his right hand to get everyone to calm down. He didn't need to incite a riot among his pack members before he got a chance to introduce Michael to them. Regardless of who it was that was responsible for Latanya's kidnapping and death, the three of us were sent off to live with other families, but we kept in touch with each other. Both Noel and Latroy had found their mates. I have unfortunately been informed by my mate and his sister that they were both killed and their children are missing. He waited as the members of the pack began to murmur amongst themselves. He knew that he had a lot of information to give them to process, but unfortunately they didn't really have that much time to grieve and understand everything. They had to prepare themselves for battle. My mate, Michael, and his sister Katharina, and her mate Lucy are here to offer their assistance to us. Michael is deaf, but Katharina is hearing, and will translate for you if you need a translator. We need to prepare for war with the Prasachi Pact. I know for a fact that Alfred Prasachi has declared war with our pack, and we don't have much time to get ready for him. I also need a team of you to find out where Noel and Latroy's children are. I want them with me and my mate as soon as possible. He looked out over the crowd to make sure that he had everyone's attention. He was looking for traitors, for those he wouldn't be able to trust. He'd seen it happen often. Someone in the pack who was dissatisfied with the way things are going, seeking a position of power, wealth, and they turn on the very people who were there to help them. He didn't want that to happen to his family's pack. He wouldn't let them be betrayed by someone. Not on his watch. Who's the beta here? He called out, and watched as a massive mountain of a man stepped forward, his thick as a log arms folding over his chest as he observed them. I am, the man called out. Hal stared at him for a long time before a large grin stretched across his face. Jerome? Jerome, you old dog, you're the beta, he exclaimed with happiness and shock as he ran down the steps and threw his arms around his old friend. Jerome had been a few years older than him and had taught him everything that he'd needed to know about the proper way to skip a rock across a pond. It took a moment for the other man to react, but after a minute had passed with him hugging Jerome without Jerome hugging him back, the other man finally hugged him back just as tightly as he hugged him almost squeezing the air from his lungs, and Hal would swear that he'd crushed a few of his ribs. After a few minutes of the two friends gripping each other, Hal became aware of Michael's hand on the back of his shoulder. He stepped back and wrapped his left arm around the man's waist and pressed his nose against Michael's neck. He inhaled his mate's delicious scent and tried to stem the flow of tears. "'I'm so glad you're not dead,' Jerome said, and Hal chuckled into Michael's neck before turning back to the other man. Yeah, me too, he responded, before he called for everyone to gather in the field for battle training. It was time he led his pack like the Alpha that he was. He even pretended not to notice when his grandmother took her joint from the pocket of his jeans. The Marshall pack was finally going to fight back, and if they needed a little bit of peyote courage, then he'd allow them to have it. They were avenging family, and they couldn't afford to fail. Chapter 13 Three nights later, Michael lay on the bed in the room he shared with Howell and sighed. 
three days and nights of physical training for battle and sign language classes for the pack so that they could talk to him and each other without using words. His father had never learned sign language and he'd reassured the pack that they could use it to talk to each other without his knowledge. Three days and nights of Hal getting up in the morning, kissing him on his forehead and leaving to go and train the pack members. Then make phone calls in order to try and locate the missing children of his sister and cousin, and not coming until the sun had already gone down. Three days and nights of them making love in the room that had once belonged to Howell's parents, and Howell falling asleep almost immediately. Three days and nights of disconnect settling between them. Michael missed his lover. He missed his mate. They had just started getting to know each other better when they got to Georgia, and now everything seemed to be extremely chaotic. He understood, he really did understand, that what his mate was doing was important. He was trying to save his birth pack. He was trying to find the missing children, the ones they'd recently found out were either adopted or sold into human trafficking. Mariah and Cody had, thankfully, been placed in a foster home in Louisiana, and Howell and Michael had begun the paperwork to try and adopt them, and they hoped that things would go well. But they were both hyper-aware that they were an interracial gay couple trying to adopt children in the South. The adoption process could go on for a year or more. The other two children, Latroy's children, had been traced to a warehouse in Texas, and then the trail went cold. Michael had been very impressed with Jerome's skills as an investigator and a hacker, but that's where his admiration stopped. Jerome was still single, and Michael knew he wasn't being paranoid about Jerome being attracted to Howell. He knew that he couldn't ask Howell to stop spending so much time with the other man, but he couldn't think he was out of line by wanting to ask Howell to spend more time with him. He was the man's mate, after all. He sat up on the bed with a sigh. No matter how much he complained to himself, he knew that he wasn't going to say anything to Howell about how he was feeling. It wasn't in his nature to complain to others. He would complain to himself from now until kingdom come, but he'd never open his mouth and tell Howell anything. Sighing in resignation, he turned and dropped his feet to the floor beside the bed and went to stand only to gasp in startled surprise at the presence of Grandma Mary in the doorway. She gestured for him to come over to her so she could talk to him. Grandma Mary had told Hal that she was too old to try and learn how to do sign language, but that she would figure out a way to talk to Michael on her own. So she carried around a notepad and two cell phones. They either wrote or texted each other when they needed to talk, and Michael found Hal's grandmother to be one of the smartest, snarkiest, funniest women that he'd ever met. He usually enjoyed talking to her, but he was definitely having a pity party day, and he really didn't want to have to be Mikey Sunshine for her at that moment. Forcing a smile to his face, he shuffled over to her. The striped nightshirt that belonged to Howell looked like a dress on him, so he wasn't embarrassed to face the elderly woman in his nightclothes, the clothes that he'd been wearing all day, although he did wish that he'd thought to put on some boxer briefs or pants or something before he'd gotten out of the bed to approach her. He ran a hand through his hair and gave her a hug when she held out her arms. Closing his eyes, he allowed her extremely calming presence to still the tumultuous emotions that churned in his stomach. Her scent wasn't exactly Howell's scent, but it was definitely close enough for him at that moment. He didn't understand what was wrong with him, why his emotions were so out of control and crazy. All he understood was how desperately he needed his mate at that moment. He felt his eyes fill with tears and sniffled slightly before lifting upright from the hug and looking down at Grandma Mary with a wobbly smile, his lips trembling, and waited for her to tell him the reason that she was there. I think that you and Hal need to go out to Atlanta on a date, she scribbled onto a piece of paper. Michael read the words in shock and then scoffed. Accepting the pencil from her, he wrote her his response, pressing the paper onto the wall as he wrote. I wish we could, but haven't you noticed? Howell is a little distracted and busy. He watched Grandma Mary's face carefully as she read his response and saw her roll her eyes at him before writing again. You leave Howell Fitzgerald Lorge Marshall to me. You just put on a tuxedo or a dress or whatever you want to wear and be ready to head into town at six o'clock. So you've got about an hour to get dressed. Michael stared at her in shock and when she merely turned and walked away, he knew that she was serious, and without another thought, turned and raced towards the bathroom, planning his wardrobe in his mind the entire time. Howell stood at the bottom of the stairs looking up, and trying not to whistle for Michael to hurry up. 
His grandmother had told him that his mate was feeling neglected and he needed to take him out on the town, show him around Atlanta. He'd argued at first, trying to get her to understand that he was the Alpha, he was a very busy man, when she pointed out to him that Michael was already having to deal with not only being deaf and not really able to communicate with everyone like he wanted to, but he was having to fight his own guilt for being related to the man who was the root cause of all their problems. That was all it took to snap him out of his argument. He'd agreed that she was correct, and when she offered him tickets to the opera house in downtown Atlanta, he hadn't blinked. He'd just graciously accepted the tickets and the keys to his father's BMW, and had quickly driven into town to buy a tuxedo that would fit him. Now he stood at the bottom of the stairs waiting for his mate to show up. Another five minutes passed. He slapped his hand down on the newel post of the staircase and turned to rush up the stairs and see what was taking Michael so long, when he saw him standing at the top of the stairs. Howell almost swallowed his tongue at the image of his mate, wearing a long red velvet and fur dress that clung to the top of his slim frame before flaring at his hips. As his eyes traveled over the front of his body, he realized that Michael had borrowed his mother's dress. Howell only remembered her wearing it once. She'd put it on, came downstairs to show him and Noel how pretty it was, and then had gone back upstairs and placed it on a hanger. She'd told Howell and Noel later that she was leaving the dress to them, either for Howell's mate or for Noel to wear for hers. Howell swallowed against the emotion that formed a hard ball in his throat and held out his hand to help Michael take the last few steps down the staircase to stop before him. He looked down into Michael's eyes and felt his heart slam in his chest. How could he have neglected this man, his man? Michael was the main reason that he got up every morning, and the reason that Howell looked forward to coming home after a day of hard training and battle strategies and simulations. Had he ever told him that? Had he ever actually shared with Michael exactly how special he was to him? Not before right now. Thank you, Howell, Michael said to him, his voice soft in Howell's mind. Howell smiled down at him and took Michael's face in his hands, his eyes moving over the features of the other man's beloved, unique, and distinguishing marks. From his blue eyes to his pert nose and full lips, his blonde hair, that had grown longer since Howell had first met him, was brushed and held back with hair clips. Howell lowered his head and let his lips place a soft kiss on Michael's upturned ones. It wasn't a kiss of a passion, though that was always there, simmering just underneath the surface. No, this was a kiss of affection, a kiss of commitment, a kiss of love. Howell moaned as the taste of Michael exploded over his lips and tongue and pulled away while he still could. Turning towards the door, he held out his elbow for Michael to take and lead him out of the front door and into the waiting vehicle. He was determined to make this a night that Michael never forgot, and one where he never forgot just how much he meant to Howell. Two and a half hours later, and Howell felt like he was going to explode in his new tuxedo pants. They had come into the opera house, found their seats in the balcony, and Michael had instantly dropped his hand to Howell's thigh, and had been rubbing and caressing ever since. Howell was supposed to be showing Michael how special he was to him. He was supposed to be showing the other man how it wasn't just about sex between the two of them, but all he could think about at that moment was sex. Sex with Michael. Sex with Michael, now. He saw the big grin that covered his mate's face and knew that the smaller man had done that intentionally. He'd been trying to get Howell so turned on that he did something foolish. Well, he didn't want to disappoint his mate. Without another word, he grabbed Michael's hand and dragged him off behind him. As they walked down the hallway, Howell's eyes took in every doorway and closed door, trying to find the best place to do what he wanted to do. When he saw the open door for the coat closet, with a feral grin, he pulled Michael into the room behind him and turned to close and lock the door behind them. Howell pushed Michael up against the wall roughly, lowering his head in order to sniff and lick all over the smaller man's neck. This, this was what he'd wanted since the moment that he'd picked the other man up at the house. He sucked up a red mark on the side of Michael's neck directly above his mating mark, his wolf howling happily inside of him at the sight of another small sign of his claim on Michael. He reveled in the sound of Michael moaning, in the feel of the other man pressing his erection against Howell's, as Howell licked and nibbled his way down Michael's neck to his collarbone, and then down to the smaller man's cleavage. He wished that Michael could hear how delicious his moan was, but as he pressed his leaking erection against Michael's stomach, he knew that he could at least feel what his moaning did to Howell. 
He made a mental note to tell Michael about how beautiful his breasts were. Later, much later. He was a little busy at the moment to consciously think enough to tell the other man anything really profound, but he knew that he'd be able to articulate it better later. He continued to lick and nibble his way down Michael's body, not taking off any of his clothes. They were in the coat room of a very sophisticated opera house, after all. If they got caught by security, they wouldn't have time to do anything but run, so if they were still dressed, that would make things easier for them. With that thought in mind, Howell pushed up the bottom of Michael's dress and pulled down his mate's briefs, just enough so that the other man's cock and balls were out of their confinement. With a low, happy growl, Howell lowered his head and took in the head of Michael's cock, swirling his tongue around the head over and over again, before lowering his head down almost completely, feeling the head of Michael's cock enter his throat. He moaned when he heard Michael's breath catch in his throat and swallowed around the other man's cock. Oh, oh God, he heard Michael's voice come out in a shuddering breath in his head, and knew that his mate was about to come very soon. Apparently, Michael had been wound up from the car ride over. Driving with his fingers in Michael's ass as the other man was turned to face him, his dress up around his waist and his head pressed against the door, his legs spread wide and one foot planted on the floor, the other pressing against the side of Howell's car, may not have been the safest or smartest thing that they'd ever done, but it was definitely one of the most fun. Lifting his head off of his mate's cock, Howell looked up at the beautiful blond-haired man that the fates had chosen for him. Thank you, he prayed to whatever deity happened to be listening at the time. He watched as Michael's eyes almost rolled into the back of his head, and he whined in frustration. He didn't want him to come just then. He wanted Michael to come when he told him to. Michael was begging him. He'd let Michael come when the other man begged him. Suck my cock, Howell, please! Michael pleaded, and Howell's pleasure at Michael's plea caused his chest to expand with pride. Never a man who could deny his mate anything when he asked so prettily. Howell sucked Michael's cock back into his mouth deeply and stuck three of his fingers into Michael's mouth. He groaned as he watched Michael's mouth suck on the broad digits and pulled them out after they were sufficiently wet and coated with saliva. Knowing that Michael would still be lubed and stretched from just a few hours before, Howell pushed two fingers deeply within his mate's ass, feeling the muscles stretch to accommodate his large fingers. He heard Michael's low, throaty moan and sucked on his man's cock harder. He began to fuck Michael's ass deeper and faster as he tried to bring him over the edge. He wanted to watch his lover fly off the edge of this cliff of arousal and then be there to catch him when he returned to Earth. He swirled his tongue around Michael's cock and felt his fingers brush against the bundle of nerves in the blond man's ass. Michael's hands gripped his hair in his fists as his hips began thrusting forward and back. Howell twisted his fingers and continued to peg Michael's prostate as he sucked harder on the smaller man's engorged shaft. He felt Michael stiffen, and seconds later his tongue was covered with the slightly bitter taste of his mate's sperm. Howell moaned, Michael's shaft still in his mouth. Dropping both of his hands to his pants, he quickly unbuttoned and unzipped his pants, falling to his back and releasing Michael's cock when the smaller man pushed him. He lay sprawled on the floor of the coat closet, his hard and leaking cock pulled out and seeking a tight hole to conquer. He shivered when he felt the wet heat of his mate's mouth surrounding his cock. He knew that Michael couldn't swallow his cock completely, but appreciated the fact that the man always tried to do it, no matter what. He thrust his hips upwards as he watched Michael lower his head, swirling his tongue around the head, and Howell shivered at the feeling of pure ecstasy that raced through his body. He heard Michael moan, and he growled loudly as he looked down and saw that Michael had indeed swallowed his cock completely. He didn't have time to be amazed, however, as his orgasm engulfed his body, his arms and legs trembling, his fingertips going numb as the head of his cock erupted with the force of his seed. As he drifted back down to earth, he reached out and pulled Michael down onto his chest, rubbing his hand up and down his mate's back as he continued to shake from the aftershocks of his earthquake-imitating orgasm. Howell breathed a satisfied sigh. I think I may just be in love with the opera. Chapter 14 In the end, he couldn't be too upset with his grandmother for sending him and Michael away to the opera. Even if it did mean that when they returned home, having decided to leave the performance early, they arrived at the end of the battle between the marshals and the Prasachis. She'd explained to him later that she had to ensure that no matter what the outcome was, that someone from both packs had to survive. 
she couldn't think of any two people better suited to surviving than him and Michael. They'd pulled up in front of the house and heard the howls, growls, and whines of hundreds of wolves. Without thought, he'd undressed outside of the car and prepared to run into the fight. When Michael faced him in wolf form, he'd felt a moment's hesitation. Knowing that there was no way that he would be able to talk his mate out of fighting with him, he'd merely pressed his muzzle against the other man's neck and with a small nip at his throat turned and led him into battle. Michael's wolf was an almost exact replica of his own wolf, except he was just slightly smaller than Howell's own size. He knew that fate had made them duplicates for a reason, and when he leapt onto the back of one of the Persace wolves attacking a martial wolf, he was eternally grateful that he could look out over the field and see the white fur of his mate and know that he was okay. He'd just begun towards Michael when he heard a very distinct whine. Turning his head, he saw a large wolf, a large gray wolf standing over the wounded body of a young wolf, a teenager, who had probably just had his first shift. He knew that wolf knew what that wolf was capable of, and with a red haze of fury filling his eyes, turned and ran after the wolf. He had one thought in his mind. He wanted Alfred Prasace dead. Now. He could just imagine the feeling of his teeth embedding themselves into the flesh and muscles of the older man's neck. He could hear the sound of bones breaking and muscles tearing away, the scream of terror that would come up from the other man's throat as he ripped it out, like he was doing now. Howell stopped and stared at the three wolves, all females, one with gray fur, one with black fur, and the other with brown fur. All three of them charged at Alfred from different angles and ripped him apart with their teeth. Howell stood there in shock, before allowing himself to shift back into his male form. Who were these women who had denied him the thrill of the kill? He waited for them to all shift back and gasped when he saw who they were. Lucy, Katharina, and his grandma Mary. He shook his head in amazement and then threw his head back and laughed. It was a laugh so loud and filled with joy that it caused every other wolf to stop their fighting to look at him in confusion and shock. Alfred Prasace is dead. My fight is not with you. If you would like to continue this war, have your new Alpha declare war with me. Otherwise, I would like there to be peace between our packs. It is my deepest wish. He shouted out among the field and turned as he felt Michael press himself against his side as they waited. He told Michael that his father was dead and saw as his mate sighed with relief. He wrapped his arm around him as they waited for the new alpha of the Prasace pack to show himself to them. Finally, a rather imposing figure of a man approached them. He had a large healing scar on his thigh and his arm and held out his hand to Howell as he stopped before him. Howell held out his hand to him as well, before gesturing to Jerome to come over and shake the other man's hand. Alpha Howell, I am now Alpha Cole, and I accept your offer of peace. Alpha Cole stated diplomatically. Howell nodded and shook his hand before stepping back and allowing Alpha Cole to shake Jerome's hand. Squeezing Michael closer to him, he turned to address both packs. Alpha Alfred Prasace, terrorized, kidnapped, raped and murdered members of the Marshall Pack just because they were black. Racism, homophobia, transphobia, and any other type of discrimination and prejudice are not things that we as wolf shifters should employ. We are the minority in this world. We must stick together, working together to protect each other from those on the outside who would seek to kill us. Do not allow this feud to continue. We are all a part of the same species. We are all shifters, no matter the pack or the color, which means we are all family. His speech over, Hal pressed a kiss to Michael's temple. Thanks for giving me the words, baby, he said to the other man, and his heart skipped a beat when he saw the sweet smile on Michael's face. He loved his birth pack, but he loved his mate much more, and more than that, Georgia wasn't home for him any more. Texas was home. He would talk to Michael and be sure that he was okay with them, only staying for a brief time, and as soon as they could manage it, he wanted to head back to Tate Ranch. Back to his family. Christmas Michael and Hal stepped into the barn from Hal's office, both men smiling and Hal chuckling as they watched Tommy chase after Ton. They had just finished spying on the couple, having extremely hot sex right in the barn, and then watched as Tommy failed at getting Ton to agree to play Santa for the Christmas program that Tommy was determined to put on for the triplets. Michael turned to his mate and began speaking to the tall man almost immediately after Tommy's footsteps died away. 
Poor Tommy. He's only trying to do something nice and everyone keeps fighting him about it. Michael grinned when he saw Hal's body shudder. He can be nice all he wants to be, but there's no way that I would ever consider putting on a fat suit and dressing up as Santa Claus either. Hal responded before wrapping his large arms around Michael's body. Michael pressed himself closer to his mate, reaching his slim hand up towards Michael's hair and wrapping a few of the dreadlocks around his fingers and pulling on them delicately. He smiled when Hal groaned, knowing how much the bigger man loved it when he took a more aggressive position in their relationship. With a saucy grin, Michael drifted his hand down the front of Hal's buttoned-down green checkered shirt to his belt buckle, where he caressed the wolf that was there. So are you saying that if I asked you nicely that you wouldn't even consider dressing up as Santa for the program? Leaning forward, he licked at Hal's Adam's apple and mentally grinned when he felt the other man shudder, his hand squeezing Michael's ass. I'm saying that I'm not Tom. I don't think I'd make a very good Santa, Hal responded, tilting his head back and giving Michael more room to play. Michael snickered in his head. He and Hal had dressed up in many different costumes over the last few months of them being mated but they hadn't done Santa Claus and his naughty elf just yet. Michael would have to rectify that, and soon. I think that Tommy's trying to do a good thing, Michael told Hal, kissing the black man's jaw. He's trying to give the triplets a great first Christmas. I think that's a very good thing. And not even that, I agreed to help him out with the program, he admitted. He felt Hal stiffen in his arms, and he stepped back to look at the other man. Howell's light brown eyes, which had darkened with arousal, were slowly lightening as he looked down at Michael. Michael bit his lower lip nervously and gave Howell a hesitant smile before dropping his arms from around his mate's shoulders and reaching up to twirl a strand of his blonde hair around his fingers. He saw Howell's eyes turn and focus on his fingers and his hair before returning to his face. You did what? Howell asked. And even though his tone didn't seem angry to Michael through their mating link, Michael couldn't be positive that the cowboy wasn't a little upset. Howell had told him that he wanted him to be involved on the ranch and in town. He had told Michael that he wanted him to have friends, and Howell even encouraged him to spend time with the other mates whenever he was going to be busy with work. But maybe Howell didn't celebrate Christmas, or maybe he didn't want Michael to do anything that would put him in the spotlight. Michael wasn't sure, and while he knew that Howell would never hurt him, the wolf was extremely still, just watching him and not moving, and it was a little disconcerting to him. I'm not mad, baby. I'm just processing. I didn't think you would volunteer for a Christmas program where you would be performing in front of others, Howell explained. You made it a point of always telling me, repeatedly, I might add, that you don't like performing in front of people. I just didn't think that you would ever do that. Michael nodded. He could understand that. He did hate performing in front of crowds of people, but this was different. This was for the triplets, and the triplets were special. Very special, and they deserved the very best that life had to offer, and Michael would do his best to contribute to their happiness, even if it meant conquering his stage fright to do so. He sighed deeply. That was so easy to say, and so hard to do. The good thing was that he wasn't performing, really. He was just doing the sign language for Alex, who was going to be singing Chestnuts Roasting Over an Open Fire, Silent Night, and White Christmas. Alex was really the true performer of the whole thing. He was just the lovely assistant. He just wished that his nerves believed that. They seemed to get more and more rattled as it got closer and closer to the day of the program. Michael looked down at his feet and then up into his mate's eyes. He knew that Howell was understanding and wouldn't judge him. He hadn't judged him when he'd found out that he was transgender. He didn't judge him when Michael later realized that he was gender fluid and he'd been nothing but supportive with the whole deaf wolf mate thing. He knew that he could try and explain it to Hal and that the other man would understand. The thing was, he'd have to understand it himself first. I don't like to perform in front of people, he began explaining slowly, his hands gripping Hal's biceps as he struggled to find his emotional center and some peace. You remember how I told you how gripped with fear I was whenever it came to my ASL classes? I was petrified. And in those classes, the people there were either deaf or knew someone who was, and so for that reason knew a lot of the sign language already. Michael paused here, his mind drifting back over meeting his mate in the coffee shop, and then the moment, days after, when Howell had shown up in his classroom, here at the Tate Ranch, in order to learn sign language. But this, we're putting on this Christmas program for cowboys who freak out over the prospect of dressing up and singing and shopping and some triplets. 
who are too tiny to even really remember anything. It seems silly, and if it was, I wouldn't have any problem telling Tommy no. But he brought up a very good point. Michael sighed and then wrapped his arms around Howell's neck before pressing close to the other man, cuddling into his chest. He needed to feel his mate's heartbeat against his cheek as he explained this last part. He needed to be reminded of why he was doing this. His real motive behind accepting Tommy's invitation to perform in front of anyone outside of his immediate family was a precious one. He said that over this past year, all of our lives have changed. We've become mated, started families, a lot of us have moved. But more than that, we've all taken our individual families and made one big family. And we need to celebrate that, not just for the triplets, but for us as well. When Hal didn't respond, Michael felt a strong sense of disappointment wash through him. He thought that of all people, his mate would understand. He knew that Michael had been disowned and kicked out of his pack for being a freak and being gay and wearing women's clothes. He knew that while Katharina, his sister, had joined him when he'd left the Packlands, that his parents had stayed behind and had disowned them both. Howell knew that family was really important to Michael, any type of family. So Michael couldn't understand why Howell couldn't understand this. I understand, baby. Hal's voice came through, sounding odd to him, even through their mating link. Lifting his head, Michael looked at his mate and was shocked to see his big, strong, tough mate's eyes filled with unshed tears. We're a family now, Hal agreed. All of us are, and because of that we should have a big celebration, and Christmas is the perfect time to do so. Michael grinned up at his mate and nodded in excitement. He knew that Hal would understand. Standing up on the tips of his toes, he pressed a kiss to his mate's full lips in happiness. He knew that he had so much to be thankful for this Christmas. Not just his mate, not just his sister and his new job, not just the home that he shared with the both of them, but the new family that he had as well. He was really very lucky. He allowed both hands to trail down Howell's arms to his wrists and pulled both arms behind the bigger man's back and held them firmly at the small of the cowboy's back. He smiled at Hal's moan that rumbled against his own chest and nibbled on the man's lower lip. He knew that no one knew that his bigger mate liked to be restrained and dominated. It was something very private and very special between the both of them. He would never give away his mate's secret, but he reveled in it as well. He grunted when his erection pressed against the front of his jeans and tilted his hips forward to rub his hard cock against Howell's, which looked as if it were about to make a break from his jeans and come after Michael's ass so that it could plunder it. Michael pulled his mouth away from his mates and laughed, Howell's deep chuckle vibrating against his chest seconds later. He'd asked Howell once before how his laugh sounded and had been told that it was beautiful. He knew that his mate was biased when it came to him, but he chose to believe him. Really? My cock is a pirate now? Hal asked him with a chuckle. Michael smiled with delight and nodded. The one-eyed pirate. Both men looked at each other for a moment before Michael released Hal's wrists and they both collapsed against each other laughing and clutching each other in amusement. They were still laughing when Ross and Alex walked into the barn looking for them. Seeing the two men looking at them in confusion only sent the two of them into a further fit of giggles. Michael knew that the other men were surprised to see Howell laughing, or maybe they were surprised to hear Michael laugh, since it was something that he consciously tried not to do in front of others. All he knew was that seeing their comical looks of surprise and amusement caused him to snort in amusement and froze everyone in their tracks, before all four of them laughed. I have no idea why we're laughing, but I can't stop. Michael saw Alex's mouth form the words, and he shook his head in further amusement, knowing that the other two men wouldn't understand what had initially started the laughter. He lifted his hands to get their attention and was just about to sign what had happened when Vet walked into the barn, holding R.J. in his arms and pushing Kurt in a stroller. Richard walked in behind him, holding Amy in his arms, the little girl happily slapping her hands against the former dancer's cheeks as she chattered away in baby talk. Michael ignored the pang that shot through his chest as he thought of his dead parents and the children that he and Howell had tried to adopt. Their paperwork for Vet's niece and nephew was still being held up in the Louisiana State Department of Child Affairs. They had been able to spend a few days every few weeks with the two beautiful children, but it hadn't been enough. Each time they left, Michael felt as if his heart was breaking. Blinking away the tears that leapt to his eyes, he swallowed the lump in his throat and pressed himself against Howell's side when he felt the other man wrap his arm around him. "'What is going on here?' Vet asked. Michael grinned at the Alpha before lifting his hands to sign. 
Howell and I were talking, and I said something amusing, and we started laughing. That's when Ross and Alex came in, and they looked so confused that we laughed harder. Then I snorted, and we all started laughing, and then Hugh came in. He signed to the Alpha, grateful that the other man had required everyone that worked on the ranch to learn American Sign Language in order to be able to talk with Michael. Michael had thought it unnecessary at first. He was always with Howell or Katharina, and they could easily sign for him if need be. That was before Vet had offered him his new position, and he realized that he needed to be able to talk to almost everyone on the ranch. It also made it easier and didn't make him seem as if he were weak in the eyes of the rest of the pack. Got it? Vet sighed and nodded to him with a grin. Shaking his head, the Alpha continued through the barn towards the pen where the sheep were kept, Richard walking next to him, the two men smiling at each other and talking. Michael looked up at Howell, knowing that the other man could feel the yearning just as much as he could. He accepted the kiss that Howell placed against his temple and turned towards Ross and Alex to see the two men sharing the same tender gesture. Michael had to fight against the clawing need to know exactly what was going on with him. It was none of his business. None at all. But he still wanted to know. Giving a mental shrug, he and Alex were close, and he knew that eventually the other mate would tell him if he needed to know. Michael turned back to Howell and gestured back towards the office. It was time for him and his mate to discuss Christmas, the program, and the one subject that was sure to cause them both to get emotional. Mariah and Cody, he heard Howell's voice through their mental link, and he nodded as he led the other man away. Chapter 15 New Year's The Christmas program had gone amazingly well. Besides a few mishaps, Richard spraining his ankle, Michael's wrists being broken, Alex going hoarse, they'd been able to give the triplets and Calvin's mate, Maurice, one of the pack members who also live on Tate Ranch, the best Christmas that they'd been able to. Now Howell and Michael stood outside the front door of their cabin and waited for the car that was headed their way. Maurice had told them about two children that had been locked up in the same warehouse with him, an older boy, almost five, and his younger sister, who was one. They hadn't been there long, and no one did anything to them, but the man who had brought them into the warehouse, a Mr. Alfred Prasacci, had told the men who'd captured him that they were to be left there until they were old enough to learn the trade. When Calvin had rescued Maurice, involving the police from the town, the two kids had been taken into custody, and their next of kin had to be contacted. It had been weeks before Howell had finally been contacted. Valerie and Howell Jr. were being brought along with their cousins and new siblings, Mariah and Cody, to live with their new guardians and future parents, Howell and Michael Lourge Marshall. Howell had been humbled when he'd learned what Latroy had named his son, and then he'd been completely freaked out by the idea of being the father to four children. Michael had pointed out that he did have help, and Howell had instantly calmed. They had an entire ranch full of help, and Katharina and Lucy were just one cabin over if they needed them to come and help. He bounced on his toes when the car came to a stop in front of them and shut off. He bit his lower lip nervously. What was he supposed to do? Was he supposed to go and help the kids out of the car or not? He watched in awe as Michael walked over to the car with no hesitation and opened the door to help the children out. Howell felt frozen on the steps as he watched the four children step out of the car and look up at him curiously. He looked at the older girl and knew that it was Mariah. He knew that she was his sister's daughter. He could see his sister's spirit in her big, light brown eyes, her chubby cheeks, and the way she held her slim shoulders rigidly as if prepared to do battle. He'd been told that she was the oldest at the age of ten. Cody was six, Howell Jr. was five, and Valerie was only one. Howell watched as Michael picked her up and held her close to him, and the little girl curled instantly into his chest. He felt like an idiot as he watched his mate talk with the social worker, and he stood there staring at the other three children as they stared at him. "'Move your ass, Howell,' he said to himself, attempting to get himself to move. When he still stood there, unable to do anything more than clench and unclench his fists and swallow, panic causing his heart to pound and his forehead to sweat, he opened his mouth to tell the social worker that they'd made a mistake, and he couldn't do it. He just wasn't cut out to be a father, when he saw the other social worker, where did he come from? He questioned himself, pulled out two pet carriers. The children rushed over to the carriers and opened them. Howell felt his feet moving. Finally, heading towards the pets, wanting to see who the other two new members of his family were. He'd only taken four steps towards the animals when he heard shouting. Looking down, he saw a large German shepherd heading straight towards him. 
He held up his hands in an effort to stop the overgrown animal, but still huffed out an exhalation as his back connected with the ground, and forty pounds of hairy animal rested on his chest, licking his face excitedly, his tail wagging frantically as he gave Howell's face a bath. He finally pushed the dog off of him, and when he saw the looks of shock on the faces of his new children, he let loose a loud bark of laughter. He heard Michael snort and realized that the smaller man could see the amusement on his face. It wasn't long before the yard filled with laughter, the most precious laughter coming from the four children, all of them embodying their deceased parents. Their soulful eyes, all with a trace of pain in them, were now filled with amusement as they saw him fight off the large German shepherd and the tiny tabby cat who also found him interesting and had climbed into his lap. Finally, standing to his feet, Hal walked over to the children and crouched in front of them. He stared at each of them with a wide grin on his face. My name is Hal. This is Michael. He gestured to Michael as he signed to the children. Michael is deaf, so we're going to teach you sign language so you can talk to him. But the biggest thing you need to know is that we're going to take care of you. You are home now. Mariah stepped forward and touched his hair. Her light brown hair was a mass of tight ringlets that blew in the wind and caressed his cheeks as she twirled one of his locks around her finger. He stared at her as she watched his hair, his heart in his throat, as he looked at this little girl who looked so much like his sister that his soul hurt. She finally turned to look him in the eyes, and he could have sworn that the entire world paused in that moment to hear what she had to say. "'My mommy had hair like this. She said that I'd know it was you by your hair,' she informed him. Hal's eyes slid shut at her words, and he pulled her into his arms, breathing a shuddering sigh when she wrapped her arms around his neck. It wasn't long before his arms were filled with Cody and Howell Jr. as well, Michael kneeling beside him, holding Valerie close to his chest. He let the tears that he'd been fighting for days, weeks, months, and years, the grief that he'd held in for over two decades, pour forth from his chest with heaving sobs as he cried for Latanya, Noel, Latroy his parents, and even Michael's parents. His father had died at the hand of his own daughter, and Michael's mother Lorraine, who had taken her own life. So much senseless tragedy had occurred because of one man's prejudice. The children in his arms had lost their parents, their homes, and their sense of security. He would do all that he could to replace or supplement those things. This was his new family. He was pretty sure that they were in for a bumpy road ahead, but he was beyond ready for it. A mate and children were things that he never assumed that he'd ever have. But it just goes to show, sometimes the unassumed things are the best things to ever happen to you. Epilogue Michael ran towards the bed and leapt on top of Howell where the other man lay resting, reading a book, with his back resting against the headboard. Rawr! he growled playfully at his mate, holding one hand up like a paw. He watched as Howell put the book down and then quickly flipped him over until Michael was on his back looking up at him. Michael felt his chest rumble with his giggle and wrapped his arms and legs around Howell's body. The past month had been crazy. They had gotten the kids enrolled in school, preschool, and daycare, and then had spent days having to go back and forth to pick them up because they were acting out or crying. They'd finally talked with the counselors, social workers, their friends, and each other, with a special call to Grandma Mary, and had decided to give the kids a year of home school, right there on the ranch, to get used to their new home, their new family, and then try the public school thing that next year. However, the kids being homeschooled meant that they'd have to be schooled at home. This meant that either he or Hal would have to quit their job or take time off in order to teach the kids. They were both so extremely grateful for Vet, who had not only allowed them both to keep their jobs, but had helped them create a schedule that allowed them both to teach, work, and spend time with the kids. In theory, it was perfect. In execution, it was a dismal failure. The girls loved Michael, but were afraid of Howl. The boys listened to Howl, but tended to misbehave with Michael. So they'd rearranged things on their schedules two weeks ago that allowed them both to be able to teach the kids, together, and still keep their jobs. So far, it was working. That night had been Michael's turn to put the kids to bed, which was something that he loved to do. He signed the stories to them, which gave them the opportunity to continue to study sign language, but was also, for them, so boring watching his hands move that they all fell asleep a lot quicker. This, of course, gave Howell and Michael a lot more adult time with each other. Was that your sexy growl? 
Owl asked him, and Michael stuck out his tongue at the other man before he started smiling again. He had such happiness running through his body all the time. He looked at himself in the mirror and was happy by what he saw. He'd cast off the expectations and the guidelines of society, both hetero and homosexual, and had embraced who he was. He was Michael, gender fluid, both gay and straight. He was deaf. He was a wolf shifter. He was an ASL teacher and the accountant for Tate Ranch. He was a mate, a parent of four beautiful and intelligent children, who were thankfully asleep, and he was hopelessly in love with his husband, Hal. I love you he told his mate through their link before holding up his hand, with his fingers bent in the universal sign for I love you. I love you too, beautiful, Hal responded back before leaning over and taking his lips in a deep kiss. Michael pulled Hal down on top of him, his hands gripping the long dreads that now hung to the middle of his back. He couldn't believe how much his life had changed in a year. His life was filled with love, acceptance, encouragement, happiness, and passion so overwhelming that it took his breath away. He tilted his head back as Hal began licking and biting his way down the side of his neck, and had just opened his eyes to look at the man of his dreams when he saw Valerie and Howell Jr. standing in the doorway, Mariah and Cody directly behind them. He shoved Howell off of him a little too hard and covered his mouth in horror as the big man fell off the bed onto the floor. He crawled quickly over to the edge of the bed and looked down at his mate where he lay on the floor looking up at him. The children had rushed into the room and looked down at him as well. Mariah looked at him and sighed with a cheeky grin on her face. We were going to ask if we could have a sleepover and I'll sleep in the bed with you two. You didn't have to push Howell out of the bed and onto the floor. All you had to say was yes. Michael looked down at Howell and then back at Mariah before he burst into what he could only assume was infectious laughter, because it wasn't long before everyone was clutching their stomachs and laughing. He watched as Howell lifted each of the children one by one into the bed after kissing them all on the head and climbing into the bed after them. Michael got them all settled, once again very happy that Howell had gotten a king-sized bed and turned to smile at his bruised but still very happy mate. Night, baby, he said to the gorgeous cowboy and blew him a kiss. He felt his cheeks widen as Howell smiled back at him. Night back, Howell replied, blowing him a kiss in return and leaning over to turn off the lights. They hadn't had the night of passion that they'd hoped for, but they were together. They were in love, and they were surrounded by their children and the pets that had made their way into the room sometime in the middle of the ruckus. In light of all of that, Michael couldn't have asked for a better way to fall asleep. This has been Unassumed, 